Welcome, everyone. I wasn't expecting the high energy music in the beginning, so now I'm even more excited. Um, thank you all for joining us for the 2022 Prevent Cancer Advocacy Workshop, Cancer Screening Disparities in the LGBTQ plus community. I'm Jody Hoyos. I'm the President and Chief Operating Officer at the Prevent Cancer Foundation. And on behalf of all of us at the Foundation, we thank you for joining us for this really important event. We know there's great interest in this topic today. We've had our record breaking registration numbers. So it's this topic and our wonderful presenters that are here with us today. Um, we know there's a clear and pressing need to discuss the issues we're addressing. And we're thrilled to welcome everyone um, as we go through the, the discussion together. So thank you for signing up and thank you for signing in. One note I wanted to make is that throughout the day, it's like you you're going to hear different, different terminology being used. Language around gender, sex, sexual identity is ever evolving and we all make the best decisions we can based on knowledge, context and personal preferences. Um, in our discussions of cancer and healthcare, we try to seek language that is all inclusive and, and avoid unnecessary expressions of sex and gender. Um, but there's a lot to learn and so let's learn from that. Uh, learn from each other today uh, about why language is important and about what we can do to create the most welcoming uh, environments. Before we get started, I'd like to thank all of our sponsors, without whom this event would not be possible. Thank you our gold sponsors, Exact Sciences and Gilead Sciences, and to our silver sponsor, Genentech. We are so grateful for your support. I'd also like to thank our foundation staff who have worked tirelessly to bring this this event to life. Thank you to our Director of Policy and Advocacy, Caitlin Kudler, who you'll, you'll meet later, VP of Marketing and Development, Jennifer Niangoda, Senior Manager of Special Events and Advocacy, Amanda Wallach, Senior Communications Manager, Kira Meister, and Senior Director of Corporate and Financial Relations, Becca Gins. And of course, thank you to our presenters today. You're a talented and very busy group, and we're very grateful for your time, I think. Having so many virtual events puts um, a lot of pressure on people giving presentations because there's so much there fitting into a day now. So thank you. Our mission at the Prevent Cancer Foundation is saving lives across all populations through cancer prevention and early detection. We want everyone to have access to preventive services and essential care, which means addressing health disparities is at the very heart of what we do. We recognize that the LGBTQ plus community faces unique barriers when accessing the healthcare system, which results in disparities in cancer risk, screening, and treatment. And not one of us can reduce those barriers alone. That's why we brought you all together. We have a mix of patient advocacy organizations, industry, and LGBTQ plus community and health experts to discuss what we know, what we still need to find out, and what changes we can start making today to create a more equitable system. Our hope is that together, we can dare to imagine a world where no one dies of cancer. We encourage you to follow along with today's conversation on social media by using the hashtag Prevent Cancer Advocacy. You can find us on your favorite social media platform of choice with the handle at Prevent Cancer. So without further ado, we'll now kick off our program uh, it is my pleasure to introduce Caitlin Kubler. As our Director of Policy and Advocacy, Caitlin strengthens the Foundation's efforts to prioritize funding for cancer research, reduce healthcare disparities, and support legislation that improves access to healthcare, prevention, and screenings. She builds relationships and unites cancer-focused organizations around the importance of prevention and early detection. And that piece is sometimes missing as we focus exclusively on treatment. So um, that is her, her sole focus is bringing that prevention and early detection aspect to the table. Um, and our, and the goal is accomplishing our joint mission of reducing cancer deaths. Caitlin brings to her work at the foundation an educational background in health and medical policy and over 15 years experience in the health field. As a member of the LGBTQ plus community, Caitlin has seen firsthand the barriers that exist in our complex healthcare system, and she is passionate about addressing those challenges and inequities uh, in order to improve access for all individuals. Please join me in welcoming your facilitator, Caitlin Kubler. 
Thank you, Jody, for that warm introduction. Before we begin, just a quick housekeeping item. We will have time at the end of each presentation for questions. So please use the Q&A chat or the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen there. And if you do have technical difficulties with uh, the webinar today, do put your note in the chat and our vendor uh, will happily assist you. So now I have the pleasure of introducing our first speaker for our keynote presentation, LGBTQ plus cancer in 2022, landscape, new resources and power moves now. Scout is the executive director of the National LGBT Cancer Network and the principal investigator of the CDC funded LGBTQ tobacco related cancer disparity network. In this capacity, he spends much of his time providing technical assistance for governmental tobacco and cancer focusing agencies expanding their reach and engagement with LGBTQ populations. He leads a team of specialists who focus on building tools and sharing strategies across state departments of health. Everyone, please welcome Scout. Thanks, Caitlin. I really appreciate it. And also super happy that not just Prevent Cancer Foundation is investing the energy into assembling all the leaders to talk about this today, but that there's been, it sounds like a pretty historic turnout. So we've got a whole bunch of people right now watching and listening, and I'm super happy that all of you are interested in doing a better job with the LGBTQ plus population as you think about how to do cancer engagement work. Um, so with that, if we can go to the next slide, please. <clears throat> Although I think that's just me, we already heard about me. Okay, one more slide, please. Let me just quickly run through, if you're not familiar with the National LGBT Cancer Network, if we can go to the next slide. Um, we have a three-part mission of educating our own community members about the kind of disparities and cancer risks that we face advocating within the mainstream cancer community for more organizations to do a better job, and we'll talk about how we're doing some of that, to actually serve us, and then training providers and people who are in the cancer sphere to make sure that they have the level setting tools needed in order to do a better job outreaching and serving our communities. Next slide, please. We are one of CDC's eight tobacco and cancer disparity networks. There's a bunch of racial and ethnic minority networks. There's a network related to um, rural people. There's a network related to behavioral health. We are the LGBTQ one. And if you're not familiar with these networks, I just want to say it because we're all here really as a resource of the cancer world. And all of us are charged with doing these six things, identity, identifying knowledge gaps in the field, building partnerships and connections, offering trainings, offering technical assistance, creating and finding knowledge pieces to disseminate, and then advising on media strategies. So if you're not familiar with the other networks or you haven't worked with them, one of them before, um, feel free to look us up. Again, we are out here to provide resources so that people can have the expertise they need for disparity populations. Next slide, please. And also, um, if you're not familiar with us, we have, um, we have newsletters that keep everybody apprised of the latest information that's going on in the field. And if we can go to the next slide, we also have a resource library where anything that you create that is focused on the LGBTQ plus population, we encourage you to give it to us so that we can toss it up there and people can have examples of how organizations have done outreach, tailored materials, anything like that. And so you can look through the other things we have, but also we really encourage you to send us things so that we can kind of keep an ongoing um, specialty library for this topic and this population. Next slide, please. And if you are um, representing an organization here and you're interested in being an organizational member, just so you know, if you are a member, which is absolutely free, just uh, all we ask is that you're committed to this issue, either sharing lessons or taking information, you can have extra training and technical assistance. You also get the chance to co-brand a lot of the resources we have and put your logo on them and put them out so that you don't have to necessarily create your own resources. All right, next slide. Okay, so I'm really talking today about kind of like what are the things that we're seeing that's changing in the world of cancer, the world of queer, how do the two of those potentially impact each other to think about some, some shifting opportunities, um, some shifting places where we can think about leaning in, making a change related to LGBTQ cancer. So let's jump in and talk about, I think these days it's probably more new variables than you might guess um, are really kind of affecting both the cancer field and the queer field. So next slide, please. The first one that we always um, really lead with is that across my full life, one thing has been pretty stable and it no longer is. 
And that's the fact that the percent of LGBTQ people in the population had been very stable at about 4%. So that would be about one out of every 25 individuals you meet, reasonably you could expect would be queer identified. And by this, I mean, willing to say it on a survey kind of thing, not just closeted queer, but publicly queer identified. Um, and that's really shifting. And it's been shifting to the point where the most recent data we have is that the identification of the general US population has moved up to 7.1%. And that may not seem like a lot of change off of 4%, but if we can go to the next slide, you'll see that it actually, the shift is really being driven by younger folks and it's really starting to change in the younger populations. So here you see the breakouts, obviously of the different generations and the number of people that identify as queer. This is adult only, this is not even youth data. And if I can point out that top bar there, the Gen Z adults, one out of every five Gen Z adults is currently identifying as queer. That's a huge shift in the population and something that of course with every year that gets added on is gonna make a difference in the number of people that we're seeing who are LGBTQ identified. Next slide, please. And just to take it to its kind of crazy potential outcome, I do wanna point out that this shift is happening so fast right now that from 2012 until 2021, when Gallup did the most recent data collection on it, it has more than doubled. So if we take this and extrapolate out, actually you see on that, um, on that scale there, 100 is 100% of the population. So basically it looks like by like 2060, like 275% of the population could be queer if it continues growing at this rate. Of course, that's absurd. You can't have 275% of the population, but it's kind of exciting to think that who knows where this denominator will stop. And one of the things that I think it really then says for us, the people who are interested in being engaged with the full community of people who are at risk for cancer and experiencing cancer, what are we doing for this growing subpopulation? And if you can go to the next slide. One of the fastest growing groups related to this is really, it's a word that honestly, maybe four years or so ago, we might not have even had in our lexicon whatsoever. And some of us are certainly still getting used to it. This is the non-binary population, people who do not identify as solely male or solely female, but identify somewhere outside of those two kind of, I think of them as sometimes it's like end zones on a football field. Maybe they're in the you know center of the football field. Maybe they're in the soccer field next door. Maybe they're in like the three-story parking lot. But however we identify our gender, it's not necessarily in those two male and female end zones. It's some other construct. And this, of course, as we may be familiar with, are often the people who identify as pronouns that are not necessarily just he or she. As you can see on mine, I've got he or they as my chosen pronouns. And we do know that this is hard for people to get used to uh, because none of us are used to using they as a singular pronoun throughout our life. But I do encourage us to think of a lot of this new diversity and identification labels that are coming up and emerging throughout the community as something that for a lot of at risk and highly vulnerable youth, as something that provides all of us with more safety. If you think about it, humans are much more herd animals than we really necessarily think of ourselves as. And none of us wanna be the only gazelle alone on the Serengeti. So all of these different identity labels that are emerging are ways for people to understand that they're not alone and there's other people like them in their club which particularly for youth or at huge risk for suicide in this population, it means they feel like they have a group around them. So as much as it may be difficult for you know, us bolsters to kind of wrap our brains around some of this stuff, it's powerful and it's part of the health of the next generation coming up to have so many more of these identity labels and things like they as a singular pronoun. So I encourage you to lean in, understand how it is protective and expand our brains till we get used to some new things. Teaching the old dogs new tricks. Okay, next slide, please. What does this mean upshot for everything that I just really talked about is that there really is a wave of people who are identifying as queer that are rapidly moving into our target population. You know, cancer is a disease of aging and every year people are continuing to expand throughout this whole, uh, this whole set of generations. So 
I think it really ups the bar for all of us to be like, if we're continuing to do one size fits all programming and not doing anything tailored for the queer population, how quickly are we gonna to start to look like our own grandparents as far as really only serving the communities of yesterday and not necessarily the communities of today and the communities of tomorrow. All right, next slide, please. Another thing I really want to note about our population is that we're much more diverse than the general US population. The general US population, about 24% of people identify as BIPOC. On the other hand, in the queer population, 42% of us identify as BIPOC. So that again brings the onus. If you're trying to do outreach, if you're trying to do media materials, if you're trying to do engagement, if you're trying to tailor resources to our communities, intersectionality is not optional. It is absolutely something that you have to build in from the ground up particularly because we are a much more diverse set of communities. And this is just one of our many metrics of diversity, right? Than the general population. Next slide, please. So those changing demographics are really one of the, the biggest things that's starting to shift um, what everybody's understanding about our population. But there's some other factors that are also changing things too. One of them, I think obviously no one alive hopefully isn't familiar with how the whole issue related to George Floyd has created a racial reckoning long overdue and has really spurred on an increased focus on diversity, equity, and inclusion activities across a wide variety of different organizations. Next slide, please. It's kind of nice as we look at this DEI focus that one of the things that we're seeing now, which is a, is a big shift, is that people are realizing that you can you know, be interested in diversity, equity, inclusion because you're interested in social justice, because you care about you know, your fellow human beings on the planet, because you're interested in making sure everybody has as even an opportunity to do anything as possible. But also for the corporate world, they're realizing that it really has to do with their bottom line. If you know, what they really care about is the profit statement. Again and again, we see things like what you see here, where basically, Corporations are saying that it is beneficial to the bottom line to do a better job with this DEI work. And of course, this only makes sense to those of us who've been working in this field for a long time. If you've got you know, a huge portion of the population that you're not allowing to have an equal start, then that's a huge amount of talent that you're benching before the game even gets going. None of us really wants to do that. And then as you can see in the bottom there with that quote, Sometimes DEI is interpreted as primarily about race. Of course, we, we need that to continue, but more and more these days, they're seeing many different layers of diversity and LGBTQI status is included in that as far as a lot of these initiatives. Next slide, please. So what does this practically mean for us? Uh, as an example, <laughs> just to tell you, the number of people who come to us around, please give us trainings, please give us presentations has really exploded, has really kind of blown out of the water. Trainings are only one small part of what we do as an organization. But as you can see here, we did like 57 of them in 2021. Just so you know, right now, I'm, presenting, I'm preparing for 17 of them just myself over the next five weeks, I think it is. So, you know, as people come to us and say, what are you doing for Pride Month? Uh, these days, our answer is, hanging on because it has really pushed a level of interest in information about our populations related to cancer engagement that is historic and we are trying our hardest to keep up. Next slide. Okay, so to switch for a little bit of a, a different, one more thing that we know is really changing our field related to cancer, it's this pandemic screening backlog. People might've seen the AACR, put out a report at the beginning of this year, estimating that there was over 10 million cancer screenings that were just missed in the first half of 2020 alone. And as people know, the pandemic then continued all, you know, we're still dealing with yet another upsurgence here in 2022. So we haven't put numbers as far as what this backlog is altogether. But when you're talking about a population that already was avoiding care, is less likely to have a medical home is less likely to go for screenings in the first place. And then you add on pandemic and those kind of factors that push avoidance generally in the population. That means that we've got a nightmare scenario. And one of the sad things about that is we are not currently doing the data collection to even measure that nightmare scenario. We know we've got a problem and we're not taking action against it. So this is something that's really concerning us. Next slide, please. 
as you can see here, there's been a fair amount of talking about what this is going to mean. We already know that it's highly likely that the queer population gets its cancers found later, which means that it's obviously harder to treat. Um, when you add on this pandemic delay, which we already know is going to you know, push a surge of later uh, diagnosed cancers in the general population, what's it going to mean for our population? The story is not going to be good. And unfortunately, it's part of the history of discrimination with our communities that unfortunately we're not even going to be able to tell the story because we're not doing the data collection to monitor it. Next slide. There are some positive moves coming out of this. Um, one of the things is American Cancer Society had uh, convened a whole bunch of big organizations to talk about how to respond to this pandemic and re-accelerate cancer screening. And then these organizations kind of got together and tried to come up with some general principles we wanted everybody to do. Of course, Prevent Cancer Foundation was in the room there. And a bunch of other places like American Society for Territorial Health Officers, uh, State and Territorial Health Officers, ASTO, Stand Up to Cancer, uh, American Academy of, oh, I forget that one. President's Cancer Panel, College of Surgeon, Surgeons, National Institute of Minority Health, Health Disparities at NIH, a bunch of different organizations and also a bunch of pharmas. Now, the reason why I say that there's all these organizations, even if I can't remember all their acronyms involved, is if we can go to the next slide, one of the things that we were super excited about actually coming out of that report, which you see on the screen here, is that all of these organizations who, let's just be honest, mostly don't do it now. They all agreed to this as one of the priorities that's needed in order to help get rid of this pandemic backlog uh, and reaccelerate screening. Oh, thank you. Thank you, Veronica. You're the best. American Academy of Family Physicians. <laughs> you know how it is. It's in your brain until you need it, then it disappears. Um, and what they agreed to was that health systems reporting needs to have key demographic factors, for example, sexual orientation and gender identification. This is huge. We don't have organizations like this going on record saying we really need to have these data collected. Um, and as I had mentioned too, organizations like this usually aren't collecting these data themselves. So this is part of what you'll see as kind of a large conservative movement that you're gonna hear some more talk about later that is helping to push forward this idea of we need to collect these data because when you have a disparity population and you're not monitoring the disproportionate impact they have, Stories like our cancer delay and things like that are just never collected, so can never be told. Always leave us at a disadvantage. You don't fix what you don't measure in our health world. So measurement, as you'll see it again and again, has been a big priority for our population. Getting that changed is one of our top issues. All right, next slide. So what's another point that we have that is really kind of changing the scene for us? I, we all have heard the stories about these anti-trans bills that are going around the country right now. And I have to say that this is again, in my lifetime, historic. It's historically bad. Um, almost all these bills are anti-trans. Some of them as we see like in Florida are anti-gay in general, LGBT inclusive, but we're living in what's veritably a hailstorm of legislation against us. And then sometimes we see the health storm hit even closer to home. Like, for example, we know that a lot of the health services, particularly to underserved populations around the country, are provided by state departments of health, often with things like CDC funding, NIH funding, SAMHSA funding, if it's, you know, substance abuse, things like that, and or mental health. But as an example of what the state of Florida recently did and had a bunch of us scrambling just the other day, their state department of health put out a briefing sheet on trans teen healthcare. And what they decided to do was skip places like the American Medical Association or the American uh, Academy of Pediatrics or the American Psych Psychiatric Association, who've all been very clear about their support of trans inclusive healthcare. Because the upshot is you have the option of pausing your hormones and then you do not go through, you do not, you're not forced to go through puberty that does not fit your gender identity. It's fully reversible. And at any time later in your life, you can then restart the hormones and you can at that point go to either the puberty that you identify with or choose to go which the puberty assigned to your birth. But of course the right wing is presenting this as highly controversial, not reversible, which is totally false. 
And so places like the Florida Department of Health are putting out these briefing sheets where they ignore these big medical associations who've supported it. They instead go to places like the Catholic Medical Journal, which I didn't even know existed. And they pick uh, science that is at a different level of uh, authenticity and um, peer review, assemble it and say it's really bad. So trans youth healthcare is very bad and isn't supported and definitely should not happen in the state of Florida. The reason why this relates to cancer is because every time we feel like we're under attack from those organizations, they're actually the ones usually providing the support care, the extra resources for disparity populations, the free screening programs for cancer, things like that. It leaves us much more wary of going to those services. So the fact that these anti-trans and anti-queer bills they're not just about trans youth. They're about how all of us feel about the government and what level of under attack, and in some cases criminalized, we feel like our community is, which is very bad for us engaging with the people that we need to in order to get our screenings and our care. Next slide. Now we see it in other subtle and yet powerful ways too. Um, if people, as you can see from the slide before, we do not have national civil rights in the queer community. We only have it in locality by locality. Like for example, I live in the state of Rhode Island because when I was thinking about where to move, I saw that it was the second state in the country to pass trans civil rights statewide. I really love that. And so this is the reason why I'm sitting here now or standing here now, but we don't have it nationally. We're still fighting for that. We actually thought that this would be a time when we could get it through the Senate finally when we had that Georgia Senate win. It hasn't been the case, but if we can go to the next slide, please. You'll see that last year there was a big presentation on this at um, in Congress. And that was really great that they were talking about passing the Equality Act. What isn't so great is that you can see the bottom of the slide here. It was supported by and brought to us by the tobacco industry. You know, our friendly, huge set of multinational corporations that sells something that results in death when used as intended. So there's a lot of ways that unfortunately we're still a uh, low hanging fruit and an easy target for some of these companies that are very, very entwined with our cancer trajectory. Next slide, please. All right, so what's another factor that is really kind of changing this arena too? The cancer moonshot, as we all know, has been re dusted off, brought back up. These are a bunch of pictures actually from when uh, myself and Tony went to the White House for the cancer moonshot launch event. Um, and this is exciting. You know, one of the things I think that was really powerful about that is that you realize that we have never had a set of people in both the presidency and the vice presidency who are as personally impacted by cancer as this set of people is. So this is near and dear to everybody's hearts at the top levels of government. And so I think we're all kind of thinking, what could this mean? What would this redux moonshot mean? And we are already seeing a lot of movement. We don't, we don't yet know exactly how this is all gonna be interpreted and put into place, but we do know that the White House is reaching out again and again to be like, let's hear from you, more ideas, what can happen? And um, uh, just about a week and a half ago, we were on a tobacco cessation um, webinar that was conducted in conjunction with HHS and the White House about the Cancer Moonshot Initiative. And, you know, they were gonna say, you know, FDA has been doing some really great outreach things for the LGBTQI population. And I was able to bring up, you know, actually under a prior administration, we had much larger cessation initiatives like smokefree.gov had an LGBT sub webpage that has been disappeared now. So we're able to kind of say, hey, we need to go back to some resources that used to happen. There were some big campaigns that used to happen that were really associated with cancer um, avoidance, right? You know, with tobacco. And we're hoping that that brings back some of those resources and also creates some new ones that we think will actually start to really change the field. But this is just to give you some framing, the last time the cancer moonshot was around, we kind of had to fight to be in. This time it's very clear that LGBTQI communities are at the table from the start and we will be much more engaged into whatever ends up growing out of the many, many people who are working on restarting that. Okay, next slide, please. Another new thing that we've got in the field is that, oh, and let me just stop for half a second to say that please think about questions and um, you can put them up in the chat now. And I love to be interrupted because I bore myself. So please put them either up in the chat now, or we're gonna have 10 minutes at the end where we're also gonna be answering questions too. So um, please 
throw out anything you can. All right, so another good, great thing that we have that's new in the field that's kind of changing what we have to work with is that we were able to conduct the, the largest cancer survivor survey of the queer community. Last year, it came out. It is, was out the National Cancer Survey. And we were really delighted that with the help of some industry, Bristol Myers Squibb, we were able to get 2,700 respondents to this. This is more information than we've ever gotten around how cancer is affecting our lives and what kind of information, what kind of impacts and interactions that has with our healthcare experience. Next one. Andrea, it is bigger than the Moonshot CRC grant. Yeah, the Cancer Moonshot program is supposed to be the White House initiative that actually pulls together people to work on cancer avoidance screening, um, uh, cancer minimization screening care in initiatives from all over both the federal government and private partnerships. So it's really supposed to be kind of pulling together the whole cancer world. Although the, as you can see, there's named subsets of it like that. So when that cancer survey came out, what were some of the really interesting findings we got out of it? We've got a lot out of it. And if you're interested in some really powerful videos on our landing page, on our um, website, we actually have not just the original launch event when we heard from a bunch of survivors, but we also have the launch event for our gender expansive subreport and our BIPOC subreport too. So you'll hear stories from survivors like the one woman who transitioned in the very middle of her cancer care. And so she started cancer care ostensibly as a white cis male and ended up cancer care as a white trans woman and talks about how her treatment by people was different. Or another person who unfortunately wanted a transition and couldn't because we know so little about hormone interactions with our population. Because again, we're not usually the subjects of research and we're not being data about us is not being tracked in existing research that this person wasn't able to actually do the transition that they wanted to do. So they are now non-binary identified. So actually I should have said woman, non-binary identified, and they aren't able to have the full transition that they really want for their own lives, simply because we don't know enough medical information about how the hormones interact with their cancer. So lots of great stories about that. Um, and they're really fascinating videos. So I encourage you to look there and kind of get the information of what we saw as highlight takeaways for each of these subpopulations as well as the overview survey. But the thing I really wanna point out here is that one of the things that was really um, interesting about the findings is that while people said it was important to find some environmental indication that care was gonna be welcoming to the LGBTQI population, almost no one could find it. Almost no one was able to see any, any hint. And I, I experienced that myself. Again, I'm in Rhode Island, a very, very welcoming state. But as I had to go in and get my um, screening for something suspicious on my back from my dermatologist, I could find no hint what kind of dermatologist I could go to that would be more trans welcoming. And truly, I honestly had to have my partner push me before I actually made the screening. And think of how motivated I am and how educated I am. If that's the experience of a highly motivated and educated trans guy, what's the experience of everybody else in our community who's not nearly as motivated and may not care as much around making sure their cancer screenings happen? So I just want to kind of encourage us that this number, the fact that we can't see anything welcoming, and let's go beyond care to say anything related to cancer. If we don't see something that's welcoming at this point, we have no reason to particularly trust that we are going to be welcome. Okay, next slide, please. Another thing I just wanna point out is, you know, NCI designates the very best and best of the cancer care agencies. There's 62 NCI designated cancer centers that provide direct care across the country. And as we see from recent information, it's a sad state of affairs right now, as far as LGBTQI engagement at those state of the art, best in class cancer centers. Can we go to the next slide, please. You can see here that out of all of them, almost half of them have nothing that we can find on their website that is any environmental indication that queers are welcome in care. And again, if this is the best in class in what we think of as some of the best cancer centers in the world, that's a low, low bar. We actually have some things that might be starting to change on this soon, but nonetheless, it's where we are now. It's definitely something that as we can change the idea of whether or not they see a rainbow sticker when they go into an office, whether or not they have an expectation that those providers have been trained in any kind of cultural competency. If I come and say that my pronouns are they, 
are those providers going to respond at all well, or am I going to have a bad experience and want to leave? Next slide, please. Okay, so I'm just going to go over a little bit of kind of like what the opportunities are now here, what our advocacy goals are, what kind of progress we're getting on each. And then, of course, I'm going to wind up with what are some real power moves that you can do now, considering all these different factors affecting our world. Next slide, please. So we've had the same advocacy goals for a couple of years now. Unfortunately, nothing's really changed. It, uh, we haven't gotten one yet, um, but just to kind of go through them, the first one is we absolutely want that Equality Act because civil rights protections across the board for our population would make the biggest set of shifts that systemically give us more opportunities throughout our life, including in cancer screening, cancer care, cancer survivorship. So that is absolutely number one thing. Again, I told, as I said, our, our hopes for that were actually higher than they've ever been in my life, right after Georgia passed that last Senate seat. Um, and yet we're getting no traction on it right now. And here we are coming up to the midterms. So it is very likely that we hope that something can be pulled out around this, but that window of opportunity may not be as wide open as it even was before. And the second one, as I have also pointed out, is it's really important for us to have a sexual and gender minority health data collection and have it be a routine part of all the data work that people do. If you ever see demographics and sexual and gender minority is not a piece of the demographic data collection, that is part of what is contributing to our ongoing health disparities. Third thing, we really wanna strengthen the policies to fight health risks such as comprehensive commercial flavored tobacco bans. There's a real big opportunity right now People may be familiar with the fact that flavors were banned from cigarettes, except the one flavor that is predominantly used by the African-American and black communities, menthol, which is just mint flavor. Makes it easier to start, harder to quit. And now FDA has finally announced that they're interested in thinking about banning menthol. And they have an open comment period right now with FDA where you can chime in as to whether it's important or not for menthol to be banned. We fully expect the tobacco industry is gonna be guns blazing with all their millions and millions of dollars of resources to say, no, here's a bunch of community members who say menthol hurts them. Here's a bunch of red herring arguments to kind of get you confused about the concept of menthol. But trust me, from the NAACP to the Black Tobacco and Cancer Organizations to all of the LGBT organizations that I know, we're very unified. Menthol is disproportionately used by the queer population by the overlapping black population, by the Latinx population, practically any underserved population disproportionately uses this and it really encourages our tobacco risks. So if you have a chance to chime in with the FDA now on what you think about that menthol ban, it's a great opportunity. And then of course we want to routinely include SGM alongside other health disparity populations. Too often we get focused on some disparity populations and as I had said, kind of with that DEI work, SGM is still optional. So we want to be at the table more routinely to make sure that we really are getting rid of health equities across the board. And then in order to do that, we wanna make sure we're not cutting the pie smaller. We want more money into all health equity work, absolutely. Okay, next one. Oh, sorry, Andrea, great point, SGM. It's a shorthand for sexual and gender minorities. So it's shorter than LGBTQ plus, plus, plus. You know our nickname, right? Does anybody know our kind of, um, semi-derogatory nickname as far as what we're called. Alphabet, what is it? Someone put it in the text there with the alphabet. Alphabet Mafia, thanks, Valerie. Yeah, exactly. Because we keep adding letters to our acronyms. So um, sometimes instead of being Alphabet Mafia, we just go to sexual and gender minority. And also to be clear, we also wanna make sure we don't forget about inclusion of intersex in that. All right, so, oh, interesting, I like that. Super cool, excellent. Okay, so let's go over some new resources that you can use and then what those power moves are, and then we'll turn over to questions. Next slide, please. This is a bunch of stuff that um, either we or others are going to be have put out very recently. So this is all free and get and you can use it. You're going to get a whole presentation on this next, but NASM, National Academies of Sciences, Engineering, and Medicine, came out with a long-awaited report on how to collect queer data. And they encourage that you do it in all sorts of health environments, including electronic health records, everything like that. Also, including valuation of your own activities. Certainly, if you're not reaching, if you're not asking if people are queer in your own evaluation work, how can you tell if you're do good, doing a good job serving us? Next slide, please. 
We actually spearheaded a letter that came out in conjunction with that report where we got 190 organizations joined us to sign on saying basically, if you ever see demographics, make sure that SOGI, including intersex, uh, sorry, SOGI is sexual orientation, gender identity. So it's actually an odd acronym for sexual and gender minority, but SOGI has a tendency to refer to surveys. What can I say? We have the alphabet mafia. We have to live up to our name. That's where we are. We're unabashed about it. Um, but we basically said, if you ever see demographics, SOGI has to be in there. And this is something just so you know, I, I do a lot of work with, you know, the policy advocacy folks. We're talking to, you know, Admiral Levine's office at HHS. We're talking with the White House regularly, places like that. It is our top repeated request again and again and again. And our best win on it is actually to get it to be required on the behavioral risk factor surveillance system, because that would give us the most in-depth population data, like all the way down to like black bisexual women kind of thing is what you can get off of that one if we got it to be national. Right now, it's only optional for states. So about 41 states have said yes, and the rest are like, no, we'll skip it. We need to get that changed. Um, also, just to be clear, I was giving a big presentation yesterday um, for a whole bunch of pharmas that were interested in doing this inclusion in clinical trials. There's much more interest in that. We're getting a lot more reach outs and inquiries about it. Next slide, please. And then you're gonna get more on this later. So just to tell you, this is how uh, the questions are recommended to be asked for sexual orientation. Next slide, please. This is how it's recommended to be asked for gender identity, but there's a problem with question two, because like I would have a hard time marking one under current gender of male and transgender both apply to me. What would I mark? Next slide, please. So for that, and one more slide, we actually just encourage you switch it to choose all, that's all. Um, and we're encouraging uh, National Center for Health Statistics and HHS to hopefully do just do a rapid uh, testing of that to make sure it can be part of the official recommendations. Hasn't happened yet, but we're encouraging it. <laughs> Next slide. And then there's a couple different ways to ask intersex. We encourage you to uh, choose one, do it. All right, next slide. And then we've got um, some resources that we're really excited about debuting, debuting out this year. One is that we have a landing page to encourage people towards smoking cessation. It does not teach you how to quit smoking. It is meant to be an adjunct to like quit line programs, employee assistance programs, any kind of smoking cessation program that you have. This motivates us to get there. People are familiar. There's some research out there. It shows that even our smokers who want to quit are five times less likely to call a quit line. Unfortunately, probably because we don't trust them. So this is our way of kind of putting a front page on that's community driven, that helps teach us about our own disparities to encourage people to go on. So please feel free to link to this in your own cessation resources. Next slide. We also, we don't usually do direct service. We're systems change, but there was such a need for the support groups that we launched our own support groups and we're running them three times a week now. So please tell people that they're there. We estimate there's about 100,000 queers every year that are newly diagnosed with cancer. Most of them don't know that these free support groups exist. So please help us get the information out there. This is a downloadable um, flyer that you can put your own logo on and post if you have bricks and mortar, if you do any engagement with people. Next slide. And this is a super exciting thing that we are launching right now. It is um, free for 2022. It is the most in-depth and long-term training for queer engagement that we know of right now in health. The first five sessions are all for anybody who's in the health world. The last three are specific to provider clinical care, but again, it's free for 2022. It offers full CEs, sorry, that's cut off there. And um, you can find out information about it on our website. And it's, you know, got these fun little animations, all sorts of cool stuff to make it easy to get this information. And next slide. We also have a colorectal cancer toolkit that's gonna to be launching in Pride Month. So that's next month of this year. This is just the beginning with some free shareable resources. Again, if you're a member, which is free, you can put your logo on this stuff and use it as your own promotion materials so you don't have to create your own tailored stuff. And next slide. We also, right after July month stops and we get done with, I mean, June Pride Month, that's not July month, that's June. Right after that stops and we get through uh, the big nap we're gonna have to take after all the presentations and everything, we're launching a mentorship program for early career people who are interested in cancer, who are either BIPOC or queer. So we also need people like you to spread the word out to those people so that they can understand that we're gonna be offering career talks, skills building, networking resources, things like that. 
uh, get on our mailing list for this. Okay, next slide. So the last thing I just wanna say, really what are the power moves now, kind of considering the, the people who are likely on in our audience right now, what are the things that I think are really powerful that you can do? Depending on how advanced you are, of course, this can be a bunch of different things, but let's go to the next slide. And the basics, the real basics of these power moves now, number one is it's so powerful to have your pronouns on your Zoom thing, on your email, and as you introduce yourself to people. It doesn't say that you're queer. What it says is that you understand that one population, like myself, has experienced a real disparity related to the issues of pronouns and people presuming they know what our pronouns are. And it's really simple for you to say, I understand that there's a disparity. I wanna to contribute to eliminating it and putting my pronouns on there is how I do that. So that's number one. Number two, flags are big in the queer communities. You might've seen a whole bunch of the queer flags in some of the earlier slides. But I also want to put flags and kind of quotes just to say for any of your services, you have an online footprint. Some of you have an in-person footprint. For each of those footprints, look at where there's anything we can tell that shows that we're welcome. Do you have any kind of flag in some kind of quotes or do you have a literal flag that shows us that we're welcome? Look at your services and figure out if that's the case. Number four, if you do any data collection, I think you're getting the theme, collect SOGI data plus intersects. Please, please, please. And then number five, as I talked about, right now is the time when you can say to FDA that you care about menthol being banned, don't believe the tobacco industry, getting it out of here would help all of our health. And if you're looking for more information on any of these resources, just on our website, very front page, uh, you can join our mailing list on the top there. We certainly appreciate it. And I just wanna say this over on the right here, that's a flag of welcome, right? And yet that flag of welcome is something that honestly, I see stuff like that more in restaurants than I see in health environments. And that's ridiculous. We got to change it. With that, this is all of us. And some of us are on and we'll be on through the rest of the day. And we're on to questions. All right, Scout, thank you so much for such an engaging presentation. Um, that was pretty comprehensive. We have a few questions that I think your presentation addressed already. But um, just to bring them, them home, what are three actions people could take to close the gap on healthcare disparity? I mean, I know that's just a, a very general question. So, well, I feel like let's let's do those first three things on kind of the power moves now. One, do you have your pronouns out there so that you are just building in that welcome every time you are public facing? And then two, are you also checking to do that assessment of your physical and your web presence to see if there's that welcome? The idea that only 13% of us or 12% of us can see any visible welcome in cancer care places, which we know is echoed in all the other cancer, you know, engagement places is just, it's such a fixable number. So put your version of a flag out, both in the way you present yourself, the way you present your physical location and your web location. Great. Um, so I think this one is pretty, what you just mentioned can cover this industry, but we have, what are some ways the pharmaceutical industry can better partner and engage with Prevent Cancer Foundation and other groups such as LGBT Cancer Network focused on sexual and gender minorities? Well, I will say, you know, it's been interesting because we didn't work with the pharma industry very much until roughly about a year and a half ago when we started getting calls out of the blue. And people like, you know, we have engagement, we're trying to work on health equity, but we have nothing related to queer. And um, so it's been, it's been interesting because we literally have been kind of reacting to places have been coming to us. I really love that kind of interest though, because we always say with anybody, if you're trying to change a field, go to the experts in the field and the people who are already doing the queer work, we work a lot with state departments of health, things like that. We're like, you can't exactly just fund your local county department of health to do better queer work. You need to fund them to do something in partnership with the experts in queer behavior change, which in that case are, is your local queer organization. So as you think about doing this, A, get advisors in your own industry. If you're in any kind of pharma place, you have so many employees that you can create an employee advisory group. B, get an outside group of advisors too. And C, partner with them. There's a variety of organizations that are specialists in, you know, like Prevent Cancer Foundation and or the National LGBT Cancer Network for all these different community, regional organizations or other national specialty organizations partner with the people who are specialists in the behavior change. So do those three steps and you really will, I mean, I think also truth be told, we offer a lot of bang for the buck. So you really will be able to kind of make some differences that are that you can see. 
Great, that was really helpful. Um, I know you shared a lot of educational resources. We had several questions come in prior to actually even beginning this through our registration form online. Um, what educational resources would you recommend um, for, for patients? And also, are these some of the same materials that you would give for organizations and health fairs? Do you have kind of a, a multitude of information and um, what's the best place people could go to find those resources? You know, I will say this, from that survey, we asked people, could you find LGBTQ tailored resources? And the answer was for most all people, no, absolutely not. So what I would like to ask, and I keep repeating this at every presentation, is please don't wait for us to create them all because we're going to be slower. We're small. You know what I mean? So I actually kind of encourage any organization that cares about cancer, lean in and make a few, get, you know, make sure they go over to our resource library so other people can find them and copy them and replicate them and things like that. But I think it really has got to be for all of us. If we're going to try and get a resource base of information for the patients themselves, we all got to lean in and, 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 and share the weight of kind of creating all that customized information. That said, of course, the training, if you're a provider that I talked about welcoming spaces is a really, really solid starting point. People can always poke around our resource library, but I will say we spend a fair time chasing people to get things up there. So please don't have us chase. If you've created anything, give it to us so other people can have that place where they can learn about new things that, again, they can copy, they can co-brand, they can replicate. Great. Um, okay, just a couple more questions, I think, and then we're, we can move on. Um, I know you shared a lot a bit about what's on the legislative horizon. So what would you say that organizations can do? And I know you mentioned the open um, comment period from the FDA. If you could share if you know when that's going to close for people if they want to submit comments. But also, what are other things organizations can do to either support or oppose these, um, these items that are coming through? Is that a best through a statement? Or what would you have in mind for an action they could take to, to get engaged? Well, I think it depends in some ways on uh, what the level of sophistication is on your advocacy work, right? So if you have legislative work that happens on the Hill, there's a variety of different, there's the um, Health Equality Act, H-E-A-A, I'm forgetting the exact name of that, that's out and has a lot of health equality work in it. There's also a Data Collection Act that's being introduced as well for LGBTQI data very specifically. There is the Equality Act that I talked about that is our very top goal. So there's a lot of different, you know, all the way down to a bunch of telehealth bills. Like for example, we started our um, cancer support groups and they're being threatened by telehealth rollbacks because they happen because of pandemic exceptions. And so we need telehealth to stay where it was at the pandemic, during the pandemic, in order to continue to offer services like that. So there's, there's a variety of layers of different activities and opportunities. Um, and, you know, honestly, things like Baldwin's office are real leaders in the area. And so, you know, being in contact with offices like that, we usually keep you very up to date on what opportunities there are. And then the menthol thing, I don't know when it closes, but again, it's open now. I think it's open all the way through about mid-June is my guesstimate range. It could even be a little longer than that. So we really encourage you to go to FDA, look that up and, you know, chime in because the tobacco industry is going to have a rainstorm of people saying the opposite that they've paid to comment. Okay, thank you so much. Oh, I July 3rd, I, thanks Andrea. Uh, July 3rd, I think it was a 60 day comment period. So that would, that would seem about right. Um, okay, well with that, thank you Scout. Um, we appreciate your, um, your responses today. Um, we have one more quick question. Let's try to just get to that. So when referring to population and grant writing, project plans, materials, et cetera, what is the best acronym to use as of today? That's you know, I'll say the one thing you don't use is the one actually sadly in our name, we're trying to get it legally changed. That makes you look like a grandparent or something like that. I love grandparents, but it still makes you look like you're not of today. Um, so I would very at least probably put the Q plus on. QIA is great. Honestly, you can go longer and it's not really ever bad. Um, if you stay short, I would definitely, people often ask about using queer because it has an absolute negative history. But it's been so reclaimed, it's been put in a lot of our organization names, things like that. So at this point, we really encourage everybody, be ready to use queer. Just don't yell it at anybody on the street corner, but be ready to echo it back and or put it in your promotion materials. And if you're curious about whether you've got the right verbiage, make sure you have that advisory group review your materials and use Google as well. Great. Thank you so much, Scout. Okay. I see we've got a couple more things come through. We've got a lot more content coming your way. So I assure you that 
We have great panelists who are gonna be able to answer a bunch more of these questions. But with that, I'm gonna move on to our next presentation, which is navigating the healthcare system as an LGBTQ patient. Our speaker is Chris, thanks Scout. Our speaker is Chris Chamars. Chris has spent over a decade navigating the healthcare field from their professional career, providing direct clinical care as an EMT, strengthening health education in Moldova with the Peace Corps, and working in their current role at Grit Health to their personal journey as a patient in both the health and behavioral health spheres. Assigned female at birth, Chris has navigated visible and invisible barriers while accessing the care needed to live as their authentic self. As an agender, non-binary individual, Chris's experiences and education are lived through the lens of gender and assumptions that come with being labeled male or female or other. The gender-based rationales that shape healthcare policy and culture have had direct and profound impacts on Chris, inspiring them to develop effective pathways for self-advocacy and to help others do the same. Chris holds a Master of Science and Master of Business Administration in Health global healthcare policy and management from Brandeis University. After moving from Boston to DC to LA, they found a more fulfilling pace of life in their current home in upstate New York. They enjoy exploring nature, watching shows, building Legos and napping all with their dog Atticus. Everyone, please welcome Chris. Thank you, Chris. Uh, thank you, everybody. I wanted to give a shout out to Caitlin, Jody, and Amanda, and the Prevent Cancer team. Thank you all for putting this together. And um, shout out to Scott and all the other panelists, because this isn't an easy field to kind of go in, and there's a lot of negativity out there. So thank you all for showing up, and thank you, everybody who's here with us today for showing up as well. Um, so as Caitlin has said, I'm Chris. Um, I was assigned female at birth, and that's also called AFAB, A-F-A-B, the initials for the acronym. And let me tell you, that was awkward, 25 years of awkwardness for everybody involved trying to live as a woman. Um, and I'm kind of here today to kind of to talk to you all about what are those barriers and challenges I've had to navigate to kind of get to this point of where I am today and how gender has played an impact in each of those. And I'm gonna do this with sharing three different stories. And these three different stories are at different points of my gender journey from female to male to now agender or non-binary, which a little bit of a clarification on that terminology, non-binary as scouted mentioned means you don't really go with one box or the other, or you're a little bit of both, or you fall somewhere on that spectrum. Agender means more of you don't assign either gender and you kind of remove yourself from that gender equation overall. So, my first story comes from when I was younger. Um, I was a very androgynous kid growing up. So even though I was assigned female, people were often very confused as to if I was female, male, um, or what I was. And I would often get asked, what are you? And one memory really pops up of when I was around 10 or 12 years old at an airport, I was in the women's bathroom waiting in line and someone turned around and looked at me and goes, are you sure you're in the right bathroom? At 10 years old, it's very clear which bathroom you're in. And it left really like this aversion to going into any women's spaces because it was the antithesis of who I was and who I felt I was. And it was very clear that I wasn't welcome there or I didn't belong. I stuck out. And this also led to the healthcare industry as a whole. You know, that transition from family medicine to then going and finding a GYN and going into those women's only spaces felt un inaccessible and I felt concerned that if I was to sit there or if I would, I would stick out like a sore thumb. And um, especially in the beginning of the journey, there's a lot of concern and sensitivities to how you're perceived and what your safety is. And it wasn't honestly until I went to Peace Corps that I was actually forced to go see a GYN and get checked out. And it was something I did need because something I live with is PCOS, polycystic ovarian syndrome, which is something that affects the ovaries, the fallopian tubes and um, uterus. And beyond that, now we're understanding it's more of a metabolic disease as well, but more on that later. Um, the second story I have to share is part of when I was transitioning, when I was going through the documentation changes. After I returned from Peace Corps, which 
to Scout's point of doing research on which states are okay and not okay, I had spent months in Moldova scouring the human rights campaign website, looking at the state maps to see which ones have were which ones that I have legal protection from housing discrimination, employment discrimination, insurance, all of that. All every most folks when they apply to grad school, they're looking at which grad school program is the best. I wasn't looking at that. That was a nice perk. My big concern is where would I be able to transition safely? Where if someone legally discriminated against me, I had some sort of path to fix it or rectify it. Um, so I returned to back to Peace Corps in 2014 and I started hormone therapy in 20, towards the end of 2014. And the beginning of 2015, I had decided to start doing the legal um, and gender marker changes on all of my documentation. So this includes social security, passport, um, normally birth certificate. Unfortunately, the state I was born in does not allow it at this point. Uh, what else? I was in school, so changing all the school documentations, changing anybody who has been married or has changed their name understands there's a lot of paperwork that goes along with it. And at the time I had been talking to a surgeon about top surgery. And when it came, after I had done all these legal changes and gender marker changes, it was a big question of, should I change my health insurance gender marker yet? Because a big concern was, even though it wasn't legal, they, the, there was a concern that the insurance companies would try to say it wasn't approved because it wasn't aligned with the gender marker on my insurance. So at this time in Massachusetts, this was the state I was in, they had um, a health insurance law that was very similar to Obamacare and actually Obamacare was based off of it that Mitt Romney had created where it excluded that kind of, if there's a mismatch, mismatch of gender marker versus the specific care you're looking for, they can't discriminate against it. However, insurance companies are known for putting up barriers after barriers and making it really hard. So in discussion with my surgeon and with uh, the nurse navigator and everything, we had agreed to leave that health, leave the gender marker as female until after the surgery. So at least that would be a less of a complication. But it meant for months, for half of, the, for half of a year, I had documentations that had me as different genders with different names. Um, the last story I have is when I finally, um, in 2019, I ended up getting a hysterectomy. And this was for multiple purposes that led it, one of which was when I started hormone replacement therapy, the research at the time had indicated it was strongly recommended to get a hysterectomy within five or so years, because once you start hormones, your period stops. So that lining just kind of builds up and builds up and never flushes out of the system. And there was a concern that it would lead to an increase of um, cancer. Uh, not only what did I need the hysterectomy for that, there was also the pain I had been living in for almost a decade, over a decade with the PCOS, the polycystic ovarian syndrome. Um, something that was actually, the pain was agitated and made worse by the testosterone. Something that when I started and expressed this within a couple months of starting, my um, nurse practitioner at the time was like, yeah, that's something that happens. You just kind of suck it up. And this was at an organization that is one of the top in the U.S. for queer health. So it's not like a lack of understanding or research or, well, there is a lack of research, but it's not a lack of understanding or being discriminatory. It's just the way the system is. There was nothing else. And the PCOS affects more women than we know. It affects more ovary owners than we realize. And it's something that should not be so difficult to get healthcare for, regardless of the gender marker. Um, ironically though, being trans meant that I had an easier time getting the hysterectomy than if I was a cis woman or had lived, was living with the gender I was assigned at birth. Um, so, you know, there are two that are like, in terms of the hysterectomy, there's a couple parts of this of, I was living with pain that I wasn't taken seriously of the pain I was living with because I presented as a woman and female. And it wasn't until I had transitioned that folks were starting to take it seriously. And the fact that I was also pursuing the hysterectomy as part of a bigger um, surgery, part of that bottom surgery process, it allowed for me to get in there easier and to circumvent the insurance issues and the insurance barriers. Um, those pathology results at the end had revealed that I was 
my uterus and cervix were chronically inflamed. Um, my fallopian tubes were devoid of any cilia and the ovaries were surrounded with scar tissue and cysts that for decades, I, for a decade plus, I was living with and something that many, many individuals who have uteruses are living with and aren't taken seriously because of gender in a way. Um, but these three stories highlight how gender has kind of made this impact socially, medically, systemically, right? Socially in the bathroom where I wasn't welcomed, medically where I had to deal with being told it wasn't, it was just what it was and systemically having to deal with the gender markers and what is the best way to do things. And, you know, across my journey from female to male to a gender, these have been, this has been present. And so I want to end with a little bit of a call to action. When you're asking somebody what their gender is, ask, ask yourself, what is the question you're trying to get at? What information you're trying to get at? Or is it just another data point? That's, thank you. Thank you, Chris. And I, I say, you know, we are so honored to hear your story today um, and appreciate it so much you coming forward and being seen and heard. Uh, I think it's so important for other people to hear more of these stories. So thank you. Um, I want to turn to one of the questions that has come in through our registration form. Um, what advice do you have? I mean, you had this incredible story of, you know, battling various barrier after barrier, and still you've come forth and you're trying to help others still, and you helped others as an EMT and you're making it your mission now. Um, what advice do you have for other people as they, they seek to navigate the system? And maybe they don't have the same knowledge and background that you have, and, and you still encounter these barriers. Yeah, absolutely. Like Scout had said, I'm very privileged in the education I have and the experiences, and those have allowed me to see the systems in place because in each of these stories it's not the individual who i was dealing with and interacting with that was a problem or that was trying to deny me care necessarily and if they were it was kind of implicit bias or some bias that they weren't quite understanding it was more of these are systems in place and i had to work within the systems so really looking at the big picture um, the research i did of which state i wanted to live in to be able to access this care what did that look like looking and talking with insurances getting pre-authorizations, um, it's unfortunately a lot of mundane crossing the T's and dotting the I's and understanding what they're trying to get to with that system, with that reason. Got it. So what support do you think that providers could, could give to LGBTQ plus individuals as, as they you know, seek to navigate the system? Absolutely. When, that first point of when you're talking, when you're asking a question, when you're asking somebody if they're a man or a woman or whatever, try to see what you're trying to get at. Are you trying to get at, do you need to be concerned for pregnancy? Do you need to be concerned for hormones or whatever it is? Um, so one, look at what you're trying to ask and what data you're trying to collect. Two, um, really listen because I am a, uh, I'm a gender non-binary and I still deal with my own internalized transphobia and racism and sexism and all of these things, even though I've lived in all these different ways. So individual, like we all have it because that's the society we've lived in. And from there, I would say, listen, and also realize that there are going to be things that you might think, you know, but you don't actually know and check in with yourself of when are you kind of resisting something because of an internal issue. I think that's so important. I mean, I think, you know, so many of us are fail, failing, worried about failing and getting something wrong. And so we don't even try. And so, you know, if you put yourself out there and you get it wrong and let someone correct you and then get it right and, and move forward there because um, it takes real courage to show up. So um, it, it, anyone can do on that. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So um, one last question, and then I think we're gonna um, move on to the next speaker. What were there organizations or support groups that you you turn to for others that may be joining today and looking for um, support? Where where would you recommend they go? Uh, yeah, so Fedway is a really good institution in the U.S. that um, that was where I received my medical care, and they do a lot of research specifically with the queer community. Um, WPATH, which is the world, oh I can't remember the P path, um, World Association of Transgender Health. And they tend to do the policies and kind of the big picture of why do we have these certain, certain guidelines in place. And that's a great resource and something to bring to your medical team of like, this is something that's 
the policy, so let's follow this. Yes, World, Prof World Professional Association of Transgender Health. Thank you, Mandy. Um, and for those who are in the community and are looking at other resources, Reddit is a great source and Photo Bucket and similar, those similar things. Um, but it's for the trans community and the gender queer community, it's a lot of reaching out to others who are in that community to see what you need. Great, well, thank you so much, Chris. Um, we are so happy that you shared your story and um, we really appreciate you being here today. Thank you. Okay, our next presentation is measuring sex, gender identity and sexual orientation highlights from the National Academies of Science, Engineering and Medicine consensus study report. Our speaker is Christina Dragon. Christina serves as the measurement and data lead in the Sexual and Gender Minority Research Office at the National Institutes of Health. Her main role includes operationalizing the National Academies of Science, Engineering, and Medicine report, measuring sex, measuring gender identity, and sexual orientation for the National Institutes of Health. Previously, she served as the Sexual and Gender Minority Data Lead in Medicare's Office of Minority Health and as the Data Analyst for the Healthy People 2020 LGBT Health Topic Area at the National Center for Health Statistics at CDC. Christina has served in leadership of the LGBTQ Health Caucus of the American Public Health University Association since 2012 in her roles from secretary to chair to policy chair. She serves as the terminology subgroup lead for the measuring sexual orientation and gender identity. That's the SOGI thing we were talking about earlier. Research group, part of the Federal Committee on Statistical Methodology. She holds a master's degree from Johns Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health and a double major from Smith College in Neuroscience and Women and Gender Studies. Everyone, please welcome Christina Dragon. Christina. Thank you so much, Caitlin. It's such a pleasure to be with you today. Next slide. So first, uh, just a quick roadmap of where we're gonna go in this conversation, um, following some definitions, a little bit of background. Um, of course, the National Academies report recommendations, looking ahead for the Sexual and Gender Minority Research Office, and then our acknowledgements. Next slide. Next slide. So when we're talking about sex, and I think at this point, we've already heard from a number of speakers that the precis precision around language that we use is really critical. And so when we're talking about sex, it's a multidimensional construct based on a cluster of anatomical and physiological traits or sex traits. This might include external genitalia, secondary sex characteristics, gonads, chromosomes, hormones, some combination um, in between all of these. Um, intersex folks or folks who experience differences in sex development, DSD, um, are those who have some kind of uh, corresponding um, sex traits that may not be specific to a binary sex that is exclusively male or female. Next slide. So when we're talking about gender identity, gender is focused on a multidimensional uh, construct that links gender uh, identity, expression, social and cultural expectations and status, um, characteristics, behavior um, that are oftentimes linked to sex traits, but are not necessarily dependent on those sex traits. So um, this is how you move through the world, how you are perceived, how you perceive yourself. Um, somebody who is transgender um, may have a gender identity that is discordant or um, different from the sex that they are assigned at birth, whereas somebody who's cisgender might identify um, with the gender that corresponds to the sex that they were assigned at birth. Of course, there's also the non-binary folks. It's used as a sort of umbrella term to include a number of identities that lie outside of the gender binary. And this might especially be uh, inclusive for folks who are of indigenous backgrounds, gender queer, uh, gender fluid, etc. Next slide. So when we talk about sexual orientation, uh, there's a quotation from a psychologist that I really love, and she says that um, Sexual orientation is who you get into bed with, but 
gender identity is who you get into bed as. And so for sexual orientation, this is a multidimensional, again, construct that um, thinks about the emotional, romantic, sexual attraction, identity, and behavior for somebody. It's some part, part related to your gender identity, obviously, um, for somebody who is um, gay or lesbian, they are attracted to same gender um, or experience romantic uh, involvement and sexual involvement with somebody who is of the same gender. I think we're fairly uh, well versed in many of these terms at this point, um, but there are additional um, terminologies that are culturally specific, such as same gender loving um, for non-heterosexual sexual orientation within the African-American communities in the U.S., um, and then also pansexual um, identities where folks are um, ori oriented towards people of any gender. Um, and then also critically recognizing the indigenous two-spirit um, terminology that is specific to folks um, both for gender identities as well as sexual orientation, since that's more about a per person's um, experience within their social structure and culture. Next slide. Uh, within NIH, there's uh, also a um, policy that was developed in 2016 um, called sex as a biological variable. Um, and it's really aimed at basic and preclinical biomedical research that has historically focused on using male animals and cells. Um, male animals for uh, research studies were oftentimes a lot cheaper. Um, and so there was an over-reliance on using uh, what was readily available. Um, and that did not account for looking at differences in, in sex um, that could have, have significantly influenced some of that research. So um, this policy is not in uh, conflict with the work that we are doing in promoting gender identity and non-binary sex data collection. Um, obviously in human studies, um, looking at folks' uh, identity and uh, experiences is a little bit different than in some of the, the preclinical and basic research studies, but this is something to just keep in mind as we discuss and move forward. Next slide. Next slide. So we have some current measurement challenges, and one of the most critical ones is that there isn't really consensus around official standards for how to ask about sex, gender identity, and sexual orientation. Labels and terminology are fluid and rapidly changing, as many of you may have experienced or seen in the past. Um, there has been a, a wealth of development in how we have evolved our language to define and identify ourselves. Many of the terms are unfamiliar to folks who are outside of sexual and gender minority um, populations. And that can be challenging because when you're measuring something where um, folks may not be familiar with the terms that can lead to con confusion and potentially um, measurement error. Also, official statistics require time series, repeated measures. Um, it's hard to have trending data um, if you have to keep adjusting the uh, response options for a particular question. So there's a number of complex challenges around these. Um, of course, some of the other ones are related to translations into languages other than English. Um, some of them do not have functional translations since other languages may still be developing and evolving the terminology that they use to describe the uh, variety of identities. Um, and we need to continue working on how people ask and um, experience responding to these questions. I think as you heard from both Scout as well as Chris, um, there are definitely concerns about being sensitive to folks um, when they're responding. Um, and of course, the one of the hugest gaps is in measuring um, intersex folks and those who have differences of sex development. Next slide. So we sponsored the uh, Sexual and Gender Minority Research Office along with uh, 
a number of other institutes and centers at the NIH uh, commissioned the National Academies to convene a panel of experts to review the existing knowledge base related to sexual and gender minority measurement uh, and make recommendations specifically um, as well as giving guidance for their use. Next slide. This is a list of all of the report co-funders, um, the other institutes and centers that joined us um, in supporting this work. Next slide. So our statement of task for the National Academies was to review the current measures and methodological issues related to measuring sex as a non-binary construct, gender identity, and sexual orientation in surveys and research studies, administrative settings, and clinical settings, and then to produce a consensus report with conclusions and recommendations and guiding principles for collecting these data um, and recommended measures in these different settings. Next slide. The scope of the report was aimed at the U.S. English-speaking adult population, so loosely defined as those 18 and older, um, looking at more detailed response options um, specifically for uh, studies or um, settings that are more heavily populated by um, sexual and gender minorities, so not necessarily having to pay attention to the largely heterosexual and um, or straight and cisgender populations, but also uh, considerations for how these uh, questions and measures might need to be modified for those who are youth or for those who are um, indigenous uh, populations as well. Um, and then we also wanted to focus only on the construct of identity. Um, this doesn't really get into attraction or behavior. We recognize that those are important constructs as well, but for the purposes of this report, it was largely based on the identity terms and um, how, how people use those terms to identify themselves. Next slide. Next slide. So as I mentioned, there's these guiding principles, which are really central to how we approach data collection. Um, inclusiveness, everybody deserves to be counted and to count. Precision, using the terminology that reflects the constructs of interest as closely as possible. Autonomy, respecting individuals' identity and their sense of self. Parsimony, uh, collecting only necessary data. <clears throat> and of course, privacy um, and using the data in manners that are uh, respectful of confidentiality and privacy, um, which I will add is largely upheld in all of the ways that we already collect um, personally identifiable information across the spectrum. Next slide. So the key takeaways and considerations for this re uh, report and recommendations, um, one of them, the first and most critical one is that we should be collecting gender data um, and reporting that by default. In most human subjects uh, research um, that the NIH does, when they ask about sex or gender, gender is oftentimes the construct of interest. How are you moving through the world? How does your experience shape um, your health experience and outcomes? Um, in situations where sex as a biological variable should uh, be collected, then it should be limited to the situations where that contributes to the overall um, goal of the research. Um, if you're collecting data on sex as a biological variable, it absolutely needs to be um, collected and accompanied by um, data on gender as well. And we'll get to that in the recommendations for gender identity, how to do that effect effectively. Um, there was a lot of awareness that there has historically been a lot of conflation or combining of using sex as a biological variable interchangeably with gender, but as I mentioned previously, those are separate constructs and we need to make sure that we keep them um, separate and uh, well, well defined. Um, so in a situation where uh, somebody does not have the option of intentionally skipping a question, um, a self-reported response on uh, identity, they should be provided with the options of I don't know or prefer not to answer. Um, of course, if they can just skip and it's not an issue, then it's not required to have those, those options available. 
And then another uh, key takeaway is that having the availability of a write-in category uh, and then publishing those results or tabulations of those results is strongly encouraged. And this is one of the ways that we can really try to address that evolving terminology um, where folks want to be able to identify themselves with something that, that resonates with how they, they are moving through the world. Next slide. So the report also, the National Academies draws to light um, a huge gap in how we've historically been doing measurement on uh, sexual and gender minorities. And one of those ways is by rendering invisible the indigenous and American Indian and Alaska Native respondents by not offering the two-spirit category. So in a way, uh, there's already been sort of a, um, a a whitewashing, if you will, by forcing indige indigenous folks to identify themselves with the Western terminologies of uh, sexual orientation and gender identity. Um, in order to be considerate of that, it's really critical that there be some kind of a uh, screening question ahead of time to ensure that the person responding um, to the or being provided with the two spirit response category is indigenous. Um, we wouldn't want folks who are not of indigenous origin to, to be co-opting it, that could lead to a lot of confusing data and potentially um, erasing some of the disparities that we might see for those populations. However, if it isn't possible to do that, um, hopefully folks will feel encouraged if there is a write-in option to be able to self-identify through that pathway as well. Next slide. So the recommended measure that the National Academies put forward for sexual orientation is very close to the one that was originally developed for the National Health Interview Survey. Um, and that is which of the following best represents how you think of yourself, select one, lesbian or gay, straight, that is not gay or lesbian, bisexual. Obviously, if you can identify that they're uh, American Indian or Alaska Native, the two-spirit response option, and also the free text, I use a different term term. Next slide. With Along with all of these recommendations, uh, the National Academies panel did provide um, a list, a fairly long list in some cases, of future research that will continue to help advancing our understanding of these measurements. Um, for sexual orientation, that includes dropping uh, the rest of the qualifiers um, for the straight response option. Obviously, it's not necessarily sound methodology to negate other populations um, in order for some respondents to understand that that's the group that they fit into. Um, obviously, ordering of response categories, uh, either alphabetically or by relative population size, is traditionally how uh, response options are organized. This has the one that has been tested the most has obviously had some differences in that. Um, and then also continuing the research on testing for attraction and behavior. Um, looking at sexual orientation response options that may be more prevalent in some subsets of the sexual and gender minority population, so including queer or questioning um, or asexual response options, hopefully folks will be able and empowered to fill those out in the I use a different term response free text option. But again, that really needs more additional research. And then of course, proxy reporting is really critical. Um, particularly for youth or those who may not be responding on their own behalf. Next slide. Moving on to gender identity, as I mentioned earlier, this is the one where you kind of get at having um, the, the two opportunities to include both sex assigned at birth as well as current gender. Um, the, the ordering is not necessarily critical. You could start with what is your current gender followed by what sex were you assigned at birth. Um, I think that there are a number of things to note with this question though. While it is called a two-step question, it's absolutely vital that both questions be presented together in tandem at the same time. Um, this has tested very well with cisgender populations who may be confused about some of the terminology or have never thought about the fact that they are in fact cisgender. Um, so in that situation, it's really beneficial to have them just together and somebody who doesn't know will be like, that's weird. I'm asked the same question twice. 
Um, and obviously, you know, they, they can still slot themselves in accordingly. Um, just keep this in mind while we move on to the next slide, um, where we talk about the additional future recommendations. Next slide. Um, so obviously we need to consider testing gender specific response categories um, for the, uh, the gender portion of the two step. If you recall back to that slide, uh, the sex terminology that is male and female was used in both steps of the question. Um, and that has at least previously led to less confusion for folks who are um, not particularly familiar with gender identity um, or aware that they have a gender identity in some cases. Um, but that is definitely something that needs to be continued to be tested. Um, there might be all the alternatives for a two-step gender question that offers um, an inclusive count of gender minorities without asking about sex assigned at birth. Um, one of the utilities of asking about sex assigned at birth is that folks who say, for example, selected female assigned at birth and selected male as current gender, um, that would allow uh, us as, as researchers to identify people who have had trans experience, but do not currently identify as transgender. Many folks within the trans community may simply identify with their gender um, and not as, uh, as, as transgender. I, we recognize that the, the select only one in the gender um, uh, step of the current gender step of the two-step question um, has some challenges around that since many folks believe that a select all that apply option um, would give folks more latitude to both identify with their current gender as well as being trans. Um, again, some of the more uh, granular uh, future research areas are including response options like non-binary in the gender identity response categories and potentially including a non-binary response when asking about sex assigned at birth, um, since there are a number of states that are moving towards allowing uh, parents to select a X marker or a non-binary um, designation on original birth certificates as well. Next slide. And then moving on to non-binary sex, um, there has not been a huge amount of testing around um, intersex and DSD uh, conditions in general uh, surveys and um, clinical studies. So uh, the information that was available suggests that this should be a standalone question um, and have at least a little bit of information for folks who may or may not be familiar with this. Um, and this should be an additional um, question, not necessarily folding in like intersex to a uh, to the sex assigned at birth uh, option within the gender identity question. We recognize and the panel recognizes and brings this up to um, the top of awareness that in some cases it is very closely linked to somebody's gender identity, but really we are trying to separate out some of these constructs and in some cases, folks may or may not know whether or not they have um, a DSD condition or um, have been diagnosed in the past. So uh, next slide. The recommended topics for future research uh, include further testing of using the single item uh, intersex DSD status questions, um, particularly in the general population. Um, previously, most of them have only been um, uh, available for uh, specific studies that are already looking at intersex and DSD folks. So really testing this in the wider um, uh, environment will be really beneficial. Also looking within um, the report to see um, which measures uh, could be the most useful in a range of settings. There might need to be some language tailoring depending on whether this is for a survey or if it's in a clinical setting. 
Um, in some cases, I'm not sure that it would even be appropriate for administrative data sets, but it, it could potentially be. And so we just really need to work on um, advancing a lot of that additional uh, research. Um, proxy reporting, again, a critical thing across all of these constructs um, for really looking at and investigating how caregivers might be responding um, on their child or uh, responsible person's uh, behalf. Next slide. Next slide. <laughs> so the future directions for the Sexual and Gender Minority Research Office, um, we're working to collaborate with our research coordinating committee to map out opportunities to work with other institute centers and offices across the NIH and update recommended questions where they exist. And if they don't already exist in our existing data systems and surveys, then making sure that they're added and are aligned. Um, we're also hoping to be able to update um, the SGMRO's website so that uh, all of this information is easily available and sort of focused and centered around the recommendations from the National Academies report. Uh, and we're working to collaborate and provide technical assistance both across um, NIH and HHS, as well as through our interagency work uh, across the federal government. Um, hopefully, we will be able to collaborate and advance on testing new measures um, and following up on the recommended future research that's laid out in this report. Next slide. Some examples of our outreach and implementation, we're meeting with uh, uh, the National Human Genome Research Initiative's Phoenix Toolkit. Um, they have modules that focus on um, sexual orientation and gender identity. So we're going to work with them, hopefully to get those updated and aligned with some of the NASEM recommendations. Um, we are hoping to get um, some of these questions added to the NIH Common Data Elements Repository, which would allow investigators to just pop in and select measures to include in their studies. Um, along with that, the All of Us Precision Medicine program has uh, been briefed and is considering not necessarily wholesale, they already have a far more um, extensive a uh, list of response options uh, for both their sexual orientation and gender identity questions. But I think there are some um, takeaways like potentially um, rephrasing the, I use a different term um, for people to have a fill in the uh, free response option versus something else that could be a little bit alienating or something. So making it a little bit more affirming. We're also working with the NIH Clinical Center um, to make sure that we are um, implementing best practices there. Um, and then we've been working with the National Cancer Institute on some of their screening forms to make sure that uh, their questions on sexual and gender minority related um, identity are up to date with these recommendations as well. And it goes without saying, we're trying to align our internal HR um, offices uh, to include demographic measures in our workforce and fellowship programs and Hopefully in the next couple of weeks, we will also have a newly available option for all NIH staff to include their pronouns that will be um, available in the directory. And of course, all of these things are available for opt out. It has to be voluntary. People need to want to disclose this information. But we have seen from a lot of the history that folks do want to be visible, do want to be counted, and do want to share this information. Next slide. Next slide. I'd like to thank the consensus study committee members, Nancy Bates, Marshall Chen, Kellen Baker, Jose Baumeister, Delaine Compton, Catherine Dalk, Elia Saperstein, Karina Walters, and Bianca Wilson. Um, they did a phenomenal job and they continue to do a phenomenal job um, representing both the national academies as well as um, NIH when they go out and speak about this report and this work. Next slide. It wouldn't have been possible without the extensive list of external reviewers and National Academy staff as well. Next slide. And I'd like to thank you. Next slide. Uh, if you are interested in connecting with the SGMRO, you have our email there. You can also um, 
uh, email our director, Karen Parker, um, or reach out to me, sign up for our uh, sexual and gender minority listserv, and also check out our website. Uh, and there's just a couple of examples of some of the products that we have available. Thanks so much. Thank you, Christina. This is great information. Um, I think we do have time for two quick questions. Um, how, I mean, obviously the NIH commissioned this report, groundbreaking report for everyone um, who knows that this, this is a huge thing. Um, how have other health focused organizations received this report? And I know you shared some quick next steps, but where do you go from here? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so we were delighted to see that there was um, a, a general letter of support from over 190 um, advocates organizations, um, including, uh, I think Scout was very heavily involved in supporting a lot of that. Um, but I think there is just general enthusiasm that this has, has been done and hopefully will be the foundation for moving us forward in many, many ways. Um, we've been collaborating with a number of other federal agencies that are looking to add and, and move forward on including this data and keeping it moving forward. So I, I think that's that's the most notable. Um, but I think we have some really great opportunities, especially working with NIH extramural researchers, um, you know, who are not directly in the federal space and aren't also necessarily in the advocacy community to make sure that this is a broad spectrum approach to advancing um, sexual and gender minority uh, measurement. Great, thank you so much, Christina. We really appreciate your talk today. Yes. Yeah. All right, our next presentation is Together Equitable, Accessible, Meaningful Training to Improve Cancer Care for Sexual and Gender Minorities, Outcomes from a Pilot Study. Our speaker is Mandy Pratt Chapman. Mandy is Associate Professor of Medicine for the George Washington School of Medicine and Health Sciences. Associate Professor of Prevention and Community Health for the GW Milken Institute School of Public Health and Associate Center Director, Patient-Centered Outcome, in it, excuse me, Patient-Centered Initiatives and Health Equity for the GW Cancer Center. Her personal mission is to make evidence-based healthcare and disease prevention strategies available to more people as quickly as possible. Her research focuses on patient navigation, cancer survivorship, evidence-based cancer control, and health equity for lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, queer, and intersex communities. Everyone, please welcome Mandy. Thank you so much. And I apologize for the long academic titles. We seem to always have to do that. I don't know, I guess it plays some formal operational role at our <laughs> universities so that we can get things done, but long titles, I apologize. Um, so thank you so much for joining me and for being engaged today. I um, am thrilled to be here. Uh, we can go ahead to the next slide. Um, I Unfortunately, I have to challenge Scout because I think that Scout said that the Safe Spaces training was four hours and my training is 17 and a half hours. So um, this project that I'm gonna be talking to you about was, um, a pilot project, the team SGM training stands for Together Equitable, Accessible, Meaningful Cancer Care for Sexual and Gender Minorities. And um, really the point of the training was to equip multidisciplinary healthcare teams with information that would help them advance health equity in their settings. Next slide. In terms of funding, this was an uh, administrative supplement to an R01 by my colleague, Jean Jordan, and my, my aims were really to adapt an existing program, um, which was the Together Equitable Accessible Meaningful Training, which is an intersectional training that's publicly available now, that's five hours, um, and that training covers uh, social determinants of health, inequity, implicit bias, um, spotlights on the Black, Latino, and LGBTQ communities, and then interpersonal and system level strategies to advance health equity. So this was kind of the foundation of the Team SGM training. Um, these were the, this was the online portion, and then we added additional content um, to that that was specific to 
LGBTQI cancer spectrum continuum of care considerations. So my second aim was really to adapt the um, Team SGM program, and I simplified the acronym there. So you have an old version of the acronym, um, but it was Team SGM with six cancer center teams, uh, four people for each team. Uh, next slide. This is uh, the team that worked on this with me. This is my, my staff or a portion of my staff. Um, so a shout out to them. Uh, they were involved in um, research to develop the content, uh, working with subject matter experts, um, coordinating logistics. So I really appreciate and evaluating the training. So I'm indebted to all of these ladies for their help with this project and their continued commitment to our work. Next slide. So really importantly, I did not do this alone. Um, the next two slides, this one and the next one, highlight the subject matter experts that um, contributed to the training. So the process of curriculum development included a literature review for each of the topics that we covered uh, by my team, um, creation of slides based on that literature review in terms of major areas that we thought were important for cancer care professionals to know about, and then review of specialized content topics by these subject matter experts, and then refinement and presentation of that content by these subject matter experts. So these um, individuals I'm incredibly indebted to I include Dr. Kristen Ekstrand, Dr. Ronnie Elk, Charles Kamen, Han Leong, Anna Maria Lopez, Aaron Lubier, and next slide. Shale Mangi, uh, Mangi um, Gwen Quinn, Aza Radix, Matt Shabbat, uh, Christina Zabo, and Barbara Warren. So each of these individuals, all of whom I should have prefaced with doctor, but I got lazy, um, were in integral to the development of this content. Next slide. Okay, uh, there we go. So it was a hybrid approach, which included the five hours of self-paced content and then um, 13 weeks of synchronous webinar content. Um, so with the 13 subject matter experts, each of them co-presented a particular topic. We had three levels of evaluation that included the learner perspective pre and post, the um, patient experience uh, before and after implementation of action plans for change, and then organizational action plans and percentage of um, percentage of accomplishment in terms of the goals for their action plan. So we captured three levels, patient provider and organizational level uh, change as a result of the training. And we exceeded our goal of um, recruiting six organizations. We recruited six, uh, I think five cancer care teams, one cancer screening program for the state of Pennsylvania, and um, one community-based organization that provided services to cancer patients. So we had seven teams in total. Next slide. So these, uh, I mentioned the team training, the, these were the basis of the online modules. We required participants in this training to take um, half of the content of the team training. So two and a half hours of the content because we knew we were going to be adding another 15 hours. Um, so we required them to take online the determinants of inequity, intersectionality, inequities among sexual and gender minorities, normalizing implicit bias and strategies for healthcare professionals, um, both interpersonally and at the institutional level to advance health equity. Next slide. Um, these were the optional modules. So these are included in the online team training that is publicly available at no cost, um, but we did not require participants in Team SGM to take these. These were optional. So these are still important topics, patient engagement in research and clinical care, uh, spotlight on the Black and Latino populations, and AIDS and communication and patient self-advocacy. So we strongly encouraged them to take that content, but we're trying to be selective based on the breadth um, and depth of the material we, we were requiring. Next slide. Um, so this is the this is what the um, thirteen weeks looked like. So our content included um, logistical content about what the program would in, what the program would include and how they needed to participate, how to log into the learning management system, and what weeks and dates and times we were having the meetings, and then um, reinforcement of determinants of health inequity and intersectionality, um, reinforcement of creating an affirming environment for sexual and gender minority patients. We had several sessions on 
conducting a needs assessment and the kind of evaluation components of the research study. Um, and then we took a deep dive into some content that was not covered on the team, um, the, the online modules. And this included reflecting on bias, ethics, and organizational change, anatomy-driven uh, cancer screening, trauma-informed care, um, considerations in oncology management. And this included things like um, if hormone therapy interacts with chemotherapy and kind of the state of the field. And the big kind of takeaway there is we don't know a lot. Um, so unless there's a genetic uh, hormonal consideration that would it, you know trigger the cancer to advance, um, that that's not contraindicated based on what we currently know. Um, we also talked about in terms of oncology management, the differences in some pharmacotherapies in terms of chromosomal signature. So some chemotherapies may work um, almost exclusively in women instead of men and vice versa based on a chromosomal marker. So in that case, that has some obvious considerations for transgender and intersex individuals. Um, and I think we, we'll probably get to this in the in the Q&A, but all, obviously also has considerations in terms of how we're designing inclusive studies and thinking about, um, you know, what are we really getting at when we're recruiting people for research uh, or thinking about managing treatment plans? Do we need to know chromosomal signature for a biomedical reason? Do we need to know anatomy for a biomedical reason? as opposed to all of the assumptions that are packed into checking a particular box um, for sex assigned at birth. Um, so we also talked about policy considerations, which included things that ranged from little p policies, institutional policies, non-discrimination policies, but also things like insurance claim denials and strategies to address insurance claim denials, including um, gender ambiguity coding for Medicare and the unfortunately the fact that private insurance companies um, don't necessarily have a gender uh, ambiguity code to reduce the number of in insurance claims. But I will tell you that in presenting an LGBT workshop with Azer Radix last week, um, that <laughs> he had a brilliant strategy in terms of addressing private insurance companies that don't have an, an ambiguous gender marker consideration when they're looking at claims and basically challenged a private insurance company and said, so you're telling me that you have a uh, formal discrimination policy in place. And I just thought that was a brilliant way to approach um, a system that was kind of not being responsive to a patient in need of treatment. Um, and that was resolved as a hearer within, I think, a day. Um, so I thought that was kind of a brilliant approach, but we talked about some of those policy considerations, little p and big P, that cancer patients may um, be affected by and what providers should know. We talked about supportive and palliative care for sexual and gender minority patients. Um, and then the kind of assessing SGM health disparities and using data for quality improvement. All of the organizations needed to take um, an organizational assessment that included all of the indicators for the healthcare quality index um, through the human rights campaign, as well as all of the um, culturally and linguistically appropriate standards that are uh, known as the class standards so that they would have data from their institution to say, what do we want to work on? So once they collected that data and looked at it as a team, they used that data um, to identify priorities for quality improvement and advancing health equity for sexual and gender minorities in their setting. Um, they, then they then presented their action plans to their peers and got feedback for refinement. Um, and then uh, we skipped a week, so that's why it says 12. Um, and then uh, in the 13th week, we uh, had a troubleshooting session for any barriers that were coming up in implementation to date. Next slide. Um, so patients were asked to recruit patient experience data before and after their um, action plans. So we collected baseline data before the team SGM training 13 week intervention. And then we collected patient experience data six months after the training. So it would have been about seven and a half months after baseline. Um, we thought we did a good job by making it easy for uh, institutions to collect these data by not collecting patient identifiers. However, five of the teams still had IRB concerns. And so only two of the teams accepted the exempt status um, to collect patient level data, teaching us lots. This was a pilot. 
Um, so we collected 90 pre-intervention and 188 post-intervention surveys um, based on a statistical analysis of a pre and post test data. Um, differences seem to be null, um, which didn't entirely surprise me. I mean, there's a lot of variables that we're looking at in terms of um, patient experience, their independent samples. Um, it was only uh, six months after the start of implementing an action plan, but we were interested in looking at feasibility of patient level data collection because I feel like this is a direction that would be helpful in cultural competency work um, to really dig a little bit deeper at, are we changing things that we say we wanna change and do patients know this? Next slide. Um, in contrast, there were lots of statistically significant changes for the actual learners, which makes sense because it's much closer to the intervention. Uh, we had 22 of 28 participants complete both the pretest and the post-test. And um, the evaluation was based on a validated, a psychometrically validated scale that I developed with some colleagues in order actually designed so that we could test it in the study. Um, so we did a pre-research um, study before the intervention to validate a, um, a scale that focused on environmental cues, knowledge specific to the sexual and gender minority community that are relevant to cancer continuum of care services, self-reported clinical preparedness um, and clinical behaviors. So really the only construct that we measured that was not statistically significantly improved in our learner sample was the attitudes factor. And that's likely because of all of those factors, people coming in, you know, were self-selected. And so they already had very affirming attitudes towards sexual and gender minorities, making it very difficult to improve from there. But some of these other more um, these other equally critical things like actual behaviors in clinic did, um, did change as a result of the intervention, which was great. And here's just a quotation from one of the participants. Um, Participating in the team SGM training not only elevated my awareness of the barriers LGBTQI folks face in accessing care, it also educated me around initiatives my organization can take to ensure that our LGBTQI participants feel seen and safe when accessing our programs. As a first step, we've evolved our intake forms to include much more inclusive and diverse language and our planning mandatory staff in service. Next slide. Um, in terms of action plan progress, so teams could decide whatever they wanted to do in terms of goals for advancing health equity. Um, so all seven teams outlined their action plans and some examples of what they wanted to accomplish included a disseminating information learned to um, their peers within their organization or their leadership, um, completing the human rights campaign health equality index application and submitting it, which many of the teams did for the first time, updating patient intake forms to include sexual orientation and gender identity data, and the graph on the left shows progress at three months and the graph on the right shows progress at six months with all of the uh, teams indicating that they should have completed their stated goals within a year. So that was pretty exciting to see. Next slide. Um, so I wanna acknowledge Dr. Jean Jordan, whose R01 um, allowed me to apply for this funding to do this pilot project. Um, next slide. And um, you can take the five-hour online team training that's publicly available by going to gwccacademy.org and looking for the team training. We have seven, I believe, on-demand trainings that range from policy and systems change, uh, patient navigation, um, this team training, evidence-based communication. What am I forgetting? I'm sure I'm forgetting something. Oh, and our survivorship series, our, our um, cancer survivorship series of trainings. Next slide. So this is my contact information. Please uh, feel free to contact me with any questions that I'm not able to address today. I put a bunch of resources in uh, the chat earlier after Scout's talk and um, would welcome any questions. Um, we do have an I want you to know patient card, which allows you to collect data on sexual orientation, gender, pronouns, name, um, who patients might want involved in their care, any specific topics that they are uh, interested in talking to their provider about. We have a free uh, You Are Welcome Here poster in seven languages with a rainbow heart. 
and we have um, uh, provider tips for inclusive patient-centered care. So all of those links are in the chat earlier. And um, we are also working on adapting the Team SGM content to be hopefully a little bit short, shorter and publicly available um, within the next year. I want to go through and kind of look at where I can consolidate and um, put that into our learning management system. And I have an R25 pending where I'm hoping to provide facilitated training to cohorts of team-based um, cancer care providers over five years, but fingers crossed, I don't have the review back. So that's it, that's all I got. Well, thank you so much, Mandy. So for those who are not in the research space, can you quickly just say what an R25 and an R01 are? Just Thank you. Yes, I'm so sorry. <laughs> I've, I've turned into an academic. I, I came from community outreach roots and I've, I've, become, I've become one of those. Um, so R01s are uh, independent investigator research awards that are... Um, so Jean Jordan had an independent investigator award and sometimes NIH allows you to write a proposal on top of that award for, for a supplemental funding for a, for a targeted kind of project. Um, and R25 is an educational research study. So it's, it's up to five years of studying an educational intervention. So um, that's what I submitted for Team SGM to hopefully continue uh, facilitated training, but we will have to see. Great. And as a reminder, if you are interested in asking a question, please use the Q&A uh, box on your the bottom of your Zoom screen. We did have a couple come in ahead of time. Um, so Dr. Uh, Pratt Chapman, can you talk a little bit about the differences within the LGBTQIA community? For cancer care specifically? I yes. Assume? And well, how those, how those differences might make a difference in health outcomes. Yeah, yes. I mean, well, the social determinants of health are clearly very different among different LGBTQI subpopulations and intersectionally, right? So um, last I looked, so don't quote me on this, but um, I know that at least at one point in time, um, white gay men were among the highest earners in the country, which obviously has pretty strong implications compared to the fact that we know that um, transgender youth are or have historically often been ex excluded by their families and um, reflect a higher level of homelessness um, because of family rejection. So clearly that's just one example, but um, financial kind of stability, housing and other social determinants of health affect us differentially. Um, I mean, I could, I could talk about other things. I did a systematic review on um, survivorship studies relevant or specifically about LGBTQI individuals. And most of the studies were breast for women who have sex with women. Most of the studies were about prostate cancer for men who have sex with men. And just one difference between those two groups, because there were, there were a lot of studies for other cancer types um, and other kind of priority populations. But one um, striking finding that I that I thought was really interesting was that women who um, partnered with women uh, tended to, one, be more likely to actually be partnered, so have an actual partner as opposed to um, less formal relationship, and had greater social support, I think, probably as a result of that, although I, I mean, I, I can't say that, but that's kind of my assumption. Um, and also had um, better body image, fewer body image concerns after surgery. And again, I'm assuming because of that social support, right? Whereas men who had sex with men ha were more likely to be single, more likely to not want to ask for support from their um, friend network um, and had more body image concerns after treatment that had direct sexual side effects. So um, that's just a couple of examples, I suppose. That's great. Thank you so much for that. Um, another question we have, what are some effective strategies to educate leadership on the importance of prioritizing the LGBTQ plus community? Yeah, this is super hard and I really don't have an answer for this, but I do want to share that it's critically important. Um, and I think that, um, you know, I have a, an article that I first authored that's coming out May 23rd that was work that we did on an ASCO um, American Society of Clinical Oncology Sexual and Gender Minority Task Force uh, Research Project. And we looked at sexual orientation and gender identity data collection in oncology practices. 
and leadership support was one of the top three predictive variables to indicate that a, a, a cancer care setting would be collecting those data. The other two, because I know if you were me, um, I would want to know what the other two are, um, would be a place to document SOGI or sexual orientation and gender identity, particularly in the electronic health record um, and training on like where to put that. Um, and then um, the third was belief in the importance that SOGI mattered in clinical care. So I think in order to get leadership support, leaders need to understand why it's relevant. And so training like the one that you heard from Scout, training like the one that I mentioned, um, you know, opportunities for discussion and ongoing conversations about the relevance of sexual orientation and gender minority in both care settings and in clinical decision making, I think is my guess, uh, based on what I know, um, probably one of the one of the more productive drivers for um, getting leaders on board. That's great. That was way more than I was thinking we were going to share after you said this is a difficult question. So, so I say that because I've been at my institution for 14 years, and I will say I just got a new boss, and she comes already persuaded. I don't need to persuade her. So in some ways, I think the leadership support, it's like chicken and egg. You know what I mean? Like if it's there, you can move forward and how to get there other than recruiting a leader who is on board. I mean, I think we don't truly know, but my guess is, you know, letting people, having conversations about the relevance to practice. Great. Um, and just one quick item before we move on to our next presentation. Um, did I see in one of your final slides that your course is going to be available for free in starting September of this year at a self-paced? Oh, gosh. I Did we say September? Okay. So we are in the process. It's sitting with me. It's my, it's my bottleneck. But we are in the process of taking the content from the research intervention and um, making it a little bit more polished. And I'm trying to reduce the length if there's redundancies. And so that process, unfortunately, is in my brain and sitting with me in my time constraints. So I am doubtful it will be available by September, but we are working on it. And TEAM, which is the five hours of content, is already freely available. Um, if someone is just dying like to have the content, we do have hidden YouTube videos where if you really want to listen to like 13 hours of content, go for it. Um, but we're trying to condense that a little bit and make and then make that um, publicly accessible. Great. Well, thank you so much, Mandy. We appreciate it. Absolutely. Thank you for having me. Okay, our next presentation is our final presentation of the day, and it comes from Health Brigade. It's working with people, addressing cancer screening discrepancies, and providing a safer medical environment for the LGBTQ plus community. Our speakers are Ari Layok and Dr. Rachel Waller. Our first panelist is Dr. Rachel Waller. Dr. Waller is the Medical Director of Health Brigade. She is board certified in internal medicine and addiction medicine. Dr. Waller received her medical degree at Virginia Commonwealth University and completed residency at New York Presbyterian Hospital while Cornell Medical Center. Before coming to Health Brigade, Dr. Waller served as the Medical Director of Ambulatory Primary Care Resident Clinic at VCU. Dr. Waller is committed to providing high value care to underserved populations. Our second panelist is Ari Layok. Ari is a Virginia licensed professional counselor, a certified rehabilitation counselor, and a certified brain injury specialist trainer. Ari is a graduate of the Virginia Commonwealth University Rehabilitation and mental health counseling program and a current PhD student at VH VCU. <laughs> Ari's counseling work is empowerment based, working through, with, and around trauma, be that systemic, historical, and or single event based trauma. They work with individuals in the LGBTQIA plus community, including those persons who identify as SGL, MSM, WSW, persons who want to discuss substance use, adults seeking a polyamorous knowledgeable provider, persons living with HIV AIDS, 
as well as adults who are seeking a kink knowledgeable provider, a professional. Everyone, please welcome Ari and Dr. Waller. We look forward to an engaging discussion. I now turn it over to you, Dr. Waller. Hello, those were really long introductions. <laughs> right. So, hi, I'm Dr. Waller and I am a primary care internal medicine physician um, who is the medical director of Health Brigade. And um, Ari, did you want to reintroduce yourself or go with the original? Introduction. No, I'm going to be. There was great. a lot. Of yeah. So I will be um, kicking off our discussion, the first part of our discussion, and this will probably be a little uh, less academic than some of the other um, discussions we're having. Because when I um, started thinking about how to address this topic of cancer screening, I, I started thinking about how cancer screening in general is really complex um, with any patient that you see. Um, so after a little introductory info, which I think will be um, familiar to most people, um, at least in the cancer uh, world, um, I wanted to run through a case, a specific patient case, um, which is how I learned, um, and then debrief uh, some of the complexities of the case um, and how it's gone for me with, uh, with Ari. Um, so next slide, please. So first, you know, your basic principles of cancer screening, which are near and dear to me as a primary care provider, is that we look for cancers that are common enough for there to be a benefit in screening. We look for cancers that we can prevent or cure if we catch them in the early stages. We assess the individual risk of the patient. Is it low, average, or high? We review the evidence of benefit versus risk of all of our available screening tests, and then we participate in shared decision-making. So a pretty complex uh, process. Next slide, please. So cancer screening and mortality, the mortality benefit, and for any of my colleagues who are um, joining me today, there I use a lot of data. Um, we could do an hour just on the prostate cancer screening numbers alone, I know, um, but basically <laughs> the, the big five, when these are, these are cancers that are common, that we have um, well-studied uh, um, diagnostic tests to be able to catch them early enough and that we can treat. So um, mortality reduction, colon cancer, ranging from uh, 15 to 33%, lung 20%, and this is for smokers uh, who are age 50 and up with a 20-pack year history. For breast cancer screening, 25 to 40% 10-year, it does drop down with some time, but um, as with many underserved groups, we have limited data on male to female transgender patients who are on gender-affirming hormonal therapy, but generally the timelines for screening are the same as for all women starting five years after initiation of treatment. Um, cervical, uh, anyone for 41 to 92% and prostate 25 to 32, although again, ages 55 to 70. And uh, again, this is uh, some where you're cr uh, crunching the data, you'll see a lot of uh, differences in how providers in interpret that data. Um, for, th for the purposes of this talk, you can also uh, offer anal cancer screening for men who have sex with men, particularly HIV positive and other high risk groups, such as folks who have another human papillomavirus related cancer. We don't have a lot of data, and partly because it's a very, it's a, a rarer cancer. Um, but there is some some benefit um, seen in detecting these cancers early. It's important, I think, to have a specialist to refer for positive findings because I can do, um, you know, a digital rectal exam and I can do anal Pap screening. But if I have a positive result, that's the limit of my expertise, and I have to refer up. And when you're, when you're really thinking about talking about risk and benefit, um, the screening pr process itself is not very high risk procedure. So when you're having a conversation with uh, patients about what they would like to pursue, um, you take that into consideration. And then we also have some specific uh, screening for um, populations such as folks with hepatitis B or cirrhosis, like hepatocellular car carcinoma screening. And I would uh, point out that this is in the United States. So different countries with different incidents of cancer will have different screening modalities. Um, next slide, please. Okay, our case. Um, Tom is a 43 year old uh, female to male transgender man who's on gender affirming therapy and who's in clinic for renewal of his PrEP. He mentions that a good friend was recently diagnosed with an advanced stage breast cancer and that this has made him consider starting a discussion about screening. He's not had top surgery. He's not overwhelmingly excited to go to the imaging center for women nearby for a mammogram. There's a lot of pink, there's like Georgia O'Keeffe prints. It's like a lot, right? Um, he wonders if a clinical breast exam or MRI might be an option. The, he found information on a website that said uh, MRI or sonogram might be alternatives to consider. So what advice can I give? Um, great. Thank you for the input on lung cancer. Um, next slide, please. 
So first, I acknowledge my gratitude that Tom wants to address screening because it's one of my favorite things. The, um, and also, I'm internally acknowledging that it seems to me that Tom has pretty good health literacy. Um, which is beneficial and has already chosen for himself kind of the language that he's using to talk about breast cancer screening. He's gone ahead and said breast cancer. Uh, the next thing I would do is a risk assessment using a standardized risk assessment tool. And I determine the time as average risk. And note, these tools involve questions about age of onset of menstruation and childbearing. So assessing comfort levels about these topics is important. They also have a component of family history. Um, which, you know, the, the screening tools allow for unknown family history. And I do want to put some reassurance out there that uh, only about five to 10% of cancers have a genetic component. So if someone is unable to uh, obtain their family history, it doesn't mean that they are necessarily, you know, doomed to die of an undisclosed cancer. Um, I, this happens a lot for all my patients that, um, it actually can go the other way. People say, well, I've never met, no one in my family has ever had this cancer. And I have to explain that we you know we have cancer because we have organs and the organs can become cancerous. And, and so the fact that you don't have a family history, it does not mean that I don't want you to have a screening test. So uh, next slide, please. So then the guidelines, the next thing I wanna do now that I've determined that Tom has at average risk is to go through what I know about the guidelines and the information that Tom might find interesting about the guidelines or important to him about the guidelines. And um, this is where the complexity really starts. The, um, the guidelines, at least in primary care that we often look at, we have American Cancer Society, American College of Gynecologists and Obstetricians, and then the U.S. Preventative Services Task Force guidelines. And these are all guidelines that are put together by intelligent, passionate, data-oriented experts who really are committed to saving lives, and they're all different just because of uh, differences within the groups, how they interpret data, how they look at risk and benefit. Um, it's, it's complicated for me as a, you know, at least previously academic physician to get it, my head around, and I have to kind of go through uh, this process with my patients. You know, anyone who doesn't come to me and just says, hey, I looked at my stuff and I want a mammogram, I have to go through this process with my patients every time we have a screening discussion. So next slide, please. So a brief review, I mean, many people are familiar with guidelines that um, the American Cancer Society, um, strong recommendation that women should uh, start at 45 and look how gendered the language is. Again, they use women all the way up and down the recommendation guidelines um, that women 45 to 54 should be screened annually, 55 and older can do biennial. Um, you should have the opportunity to begin screening at 40 to 44. Um, that you should continue screening mammography as long as your overall health is good and you have a life expectancy of 10 years or longer. And they have uh, more recommendations for MRI screening for um, people who are determined to be at high risk. Next slide, please. ACOG, totally different recommendations. Use shared decision-making to select screening choices, which I think excellent recommendation. Um, they address the clinical breast exam that may be offered every one to three years for women 29 to 39, again, using the word woman. Um, that you can start offering mammography at 40 years, um, that uh, screening should start no later than 50 years. You could do annual or biennial, is more reasonable after 55 years, and continue to age 75. And uh, next slide, please. U.S. Preventive Health Services Task Force, which is, tends to be uh, the source more commonly used by primary care doctors. Again, shared decision making, which is great. Uh, clinical breast exam is addressed again, which is, again is not in American Cancer Society. Um, start offering mam mammography at age 40, um, no later than 50. You can do annual or biennial. Biennial is, is more reasonable after age 55 years. So this is a lot of information, a lot of differences. And, um, and what I need to really look at is what in all of this information is going to be the most important for my patient. Next slide, please. Okay, so the takeaway, all three guidelines have different starting ages and intervals. Bottom line is mammograms seem to have the best data when compared to other modalities taking into consideration sensitivity and false positives. And I know, again, in the community, a lot of differences in opinion about this. There are large institutions that are doing sonogram screenings and, um, and you know, basically the, the reason behind this thinking is that the risk of your breast cancer increases with age, but cancers in younger people can potentially be more aggressive, even though they're less common. And so a more frequent um, evaluation um, can be recommended in a younger population. Next slide, please. 
And so what about other options? And you know, again, speaking with Tom again, going through the, the recommendations that we have available to us, Tom would really prefer to minimize engagement in the healthcare system as much as possible while still being responsible. <laughs> right? So false positives actually are um, important, important to Tom, more so than they possibly might be for other patients. Really doesn't want to uh, cause anxiety and could result in more interaction, false positives with the medical community than he really would prefer to have. So. So other options, I have to pull up some articles and refresh my memory um, because I don't always have the most recent data on MRI and sonogram at the tip of my fingers. Um, so MRIs are sensitive. They do have a lot of false positives. The thing here, and it was a little frustrating to me because I did find some recommendations on, um, on the sort of TG friendly websites. They're very expensive and insurance almost guaranteed not to cover them. The, um, even for folks who meet the ACS guidelines. And some, uh, we at least do have a, a hospital here who will offer a, what they consider to be very inexpensive and reasonable $500 out of pocket annual cost for a mammogram if you wish to pay that, or so sorry, for MRI if you want to pay that. Um, and I and most of my patients think that is much too much uh, annually. Um, Ultrasound, more false positives in mammogram, may miss smaller tumors, but they're absolutely not unreasonable if other modalities aren't available. It can take 25 minutes, which is, again, a lot of focus on that part of the body, um, which someone might wish to avoid. Uh, annual clinical exam, higher false positives, sensitivity in clinical practice, like in, in real life clinical practice, about 36%, but also not unreasonable clinical breast exam by your provider. Um, next slide, please. So the decision. Tom decides to go with mammogram starting at age 45. Uh, we plan to make a referral to a large academic medical center nearby where they've got experience performing mammograms on men. So not uncommon to have men in the mammogram suite having things uh, um, done. And that's partly because their population is so large that they will see men who certainly have uh, in general, a lower risk of uh, breast cancer having studies. And they're also actively working. And I know they're actively working because I have colleagues there um, to make their environment more LGBTQIA friendly. Although there are their ways to go. And then reflecting on this whole discussion, you know, my patient had to have enough trust to come see me in clinic and then enough trust to disclose their uh, gender, their gender identity at birth and now enough trust that they, I would listen and affirm concerns and wouldn't just say, no, you have to have a mammogram for you. That's how it is. Um, that I have a good basic fund of knowledge and actually know my screening guidelines that I will look for information that I don't already have. I'll be able to spend that time and energy to do that and go over it with them. And that I will respect their autonomy when whatever choice they make and try to help them through that path. So um, it, again, the you know, just looking at all the data, looking at everybody's website, looking what that what's out there, I fully support everything that we can do to make sure that we are reducing people's um, chance of having undetected cancer, of dying of cancer, but it is a complicated process and it can be a complicated process um, no matter who you're seeing. And, I, and I'd like to say too that only a little bit of this process had anything to do with my patient's gender at birth or their identity. Like it, this is a complicated process no matter who you're talking to and the additional effort that is required to treat your patient as an individual should not that should be something that you look at for everyone. It, it should not stop you from being able to do this well. And there was there was something you said, uh, Dr. Waller, that you know when we talk about autonomy and recognizing working with your client, you had specifically and intentionally acknowledged that your client used the word breast. And earlier, I noticed um, in in I think it was when Scout was talking, somebody had asked, well, you know, what words do we use? And I think you really identified there, well, I use the word that the client used. And so, you know, we, we've talked today about what's the right vocabulary and I don't wanna mess up the vocabulary. And intentionality really goes a long way when we're having this dialogue and, you know, being conscientious of how we interact. That, you know, also attending things like this, attending these gatherings and learning, Oh, hey, there's LGBTQIA. Oh, there's also SOGI. Oh, what, what does two-spirit mean? Can I use two-spirit? 
and really recognizing what are the limitations, what are the um, appropriate, although as a mental health counselor, I'm always slightly uncomfortable using the word appropriate, <laughs> but you know, what is, what are the words we use? And I really appreciate that A, you listen to your client, and then you also acknowledge your own vulnerability, which as providers, we're, we're a little hesitant to do by saying, I need to get some information. Yeah, we were talking about this earlier part of the presentation, and that's, um, it's true, the providers, we do tend to like to be right, right? But we also mm -hmm. like to learn things. And so um, it's it's great to be able to learn. Every time, every time I have a new question, um, I can find a new answer, and that's... That's a really valuable experience for me as well. And I also want to acknowledge that in my own practice, I am so lucky to work where I work because I work in a free clinic that um, has, it's been here for, we're the oldest free clinic in Virginia. We have a pretty strong reputation for, uh, again, underrepresented minorities of all kinds that you can come here and it will be a safe space for you. We have, um, we try to make sure again that all of we, we offer training for all of our volunteers not offer we require training for all of our volunteers we require training for all of our providers um, for everyone who works here we um we're pretty small and smallness can help it is a lot easier to um, and not that it, it shouldn't be happening everywhere but it is a lot easier in a smaller group to um get some consensus about how we talk about it and talk to our clients. Um, and so again, I am just, we, and we have a very open staff, a very open and communicative staff where if I were to um, misgender someone, if I were to, um, you know, to try to rule out a policy or that I would be able to seek out advice from my colleagues and that my colleagues would be comfortable saying no. <laughs> <laughs> if I had gone the wrong direction. <laughs> so um, that's, that's really, I'm really lucky that I've been able to be in a place where we are um, somewhat early adop ad adapters, adopters, the, um, and also that I have, uh, that I know who to reach out to in the community, that I belong to, to other, to groups where I can figure out where the um, the best place to go if you um, need to have a, a mammogram and you're you want you need to be comfortable or and I know we were also talking Ari about another case of mine right there um, a uh, a female to male transgender um, patient of mine who I need to encourage to kind of finish an evaluation for endometrial endometrial carcinoma. Um, and they were, they'd been delaying it for like two years. <laughs> it started like sort of the initial, initial conversation. And they were like, yeah, nothing's happening now. I'm going to go ahead and just pretend that, that I never had symptoms and I never had a study that was positive. And, you know, we worked a lot on finding someone in the community that would be a good first start for the next process and the procedure. And then having to send it, it to uh, providers that are not as friendly but acknowledging that it's not it's not a terrible environment, but it's also uncomfortable as a man to be sitting in the gynecologist's office um, every two months. Um, and you know, but acknowledging that together and being like, oh, sorry about that, but you're not allowed to die of cancer. You told me that when you got diagnosed, you weren't going to. And so we're gonna keep going. Well, and you know, something, and you can go to the next slide, please. Something that I think you're you're talking about is really health disparities, right? And how does you know, the creepy mental health provider comes in and says, well, so how do we communicate? How do we acknowledge the difficulty accessing care? Well, you do that by saying, hey, you know, let's go to this provider. And I know that they're not great in this arena. And as your primary care, I'm going to support you. And, you know, when you talked about this 25 minute procedure, well, again, the, the benefit of us working together, and we know that, you know, not only for persons providing cancer care, but also for clients, mental health and trauma and resilience and, and having that holistic approach is really important, right? So, you know, I can work with that client to navigate those 25 minutes. And as a team, we can work together to help lift and support this person and also bring in their circle of support. And that's something um, we haven't necessarily talked a lot about when we talk about partners or we talk about who do you tell good news, who do you tell bad news? 
Um, and, and who do you have that you can ask, you know, to help you while you're recovering or while you're navigating this? And if that person doesn't necessarily have um, those people that they know they can name, there's a question about how do we support LGBTQIA plus community members? You can go to the next slide, please. We can help support um, LGBTQIA community members by um, going to pride events as, as providers. And it is not super expensive to make yourself a sticker or a button that says, I'm a doctor who cares about you, or I'm a nurse who cares about you, or I'm, um, I'm a counselor and I care about you, you know, and showing up. Um, participating, find your local pride center. Almost every city and town has a pride center. Don't just show up at um, the bars or the gatherings to do solely do HIV testing, volunteering. Show up uh, for the community and let, let folks know that you're a provider and that you care. Um, one of the big ways of doing it is by coming to a training like this and having some takeaways and sharing with your team, right? Um, we have used this word intersection a lot today. And just in case, I just want to, you know, intersection is where our multiple layers and identities, that little awful Venn diagram, because my PowerPoint game is not as strong as I'd like it to be. Um, it's just where our identities come together and intersect, right? Um, I think so often when we think of gay, we, we do think of cisgender um, identifying with gender assigned at birth. We, we think of cisgender white men. Um, and as, as we saw on Scout slide, 42% of the population um, does not fit into um, white or whiteness and really being cognizant that there's so many intersections, right? And, you know, we talk about sexuality, we talk about the, um, the act of sex, we talk about the pleasure of sex, we talk about gender, we talk about gender identity, and how do all those pieces come together um, when we're trying to provide care, and specifically when we're asking about something that so many people are so severely terrified about, and that, you know, that's cancer. And Dr. Waller, you can go to the next slide. Um, Dr. Waller, you had talked about this client who said, I'll just, I'd rather wait. I'd rather just wait and pretend it's not there. And it just reminds me of this, this idea, and we think, see this a lot, working with people who are navigating trauma and trying to move into resiliency and move into thriving out of surviving, well, I'm not gonna live long anyways, right? So that delayed recognizing that there is, there is going to be continued years or seeking delayed gratification. Well, if I think I'm going to not live long because that's what folks tell me, then why, why would I go and go through these invasive procedures? Why would I seek further, um, belittlement or harassment, as we see, that's an actual recommendation from 2001 SAMHSA, and I recognize that's 21 years old, and yet um, when I do community trainings, which I frequently do, I have to remind we need to discourage our other clients and our other patients from harassing people, and that means that when I have, you know, a therapeutic group and somebody says something homophobic or transphobic, um, I set the tone as the facilitator. And it's okay to explore where's that coming from for you, because in this group, we all agreed in our group statements, we all agreed we were going to respect each other and be kind. Um, and you can go to the next slide, please. Um, this is just from the 2015 uh, Trans Health um, report that came out. They were doing one. Um, we were one of the, the testing sites, Health Brigade, to do a trans, the trans health study in 2020. And I believe it was the day before that study began, I think, um, our clinic doors were shut um, and are just now slowly reopening, which is really nice to be part of the community again. Um, I do want to say, I think that we, in our verbiage, one of the things is to be cognizant of this word lifestyle, uh, particularly as medical providers. And I was you know, going to my doctor recently and I saw the question, lifestyle, sedentary, active. I did not see gay or transgender underneath lifestyle. So really being cognizant that, you know, unless that client is using the word to describe their, their life or with whom they interact, being aware that lifestyle is not necessarily a, a term that is really, really inclusive. Um, you know, if we think about going back up to that slide where we saw those intersections, when I say lifestyle, there's an assumptive idea that I know the singular answer, right? Um, and we don't because there are intersections. Um, and I think it's really important to think, 
you know, James Baldwin had this quote um, that I just loved um, from an interview with The Village Voice, where somebody asked him, you know, using his his language, homosexuality, is, is it that important? Is it that serious? Um, and James Baldwin responded that it is that serious, the question of human affection, of integrity. In my case, the question of trying to somehow become a writer are all linked with the question of sexuality. Sexuality is not the only part of it. I don't know even if it's the most important part, but it's indispensable, right? So it's maybe not the most important part. And as you said, Dr. Waller, when you're meeting with a client, their gender was not even necessarily the most important part, but it was part of it. And it was part of how they were going to seek services and how they were going to receive services. And it's really important that we're cognizant of those. Um, and in the article where there may be impl implicit preferences for heterosexual patients, there's a 2016 article, and I apologize for it not being part of the slide, where providers also say, I, I just feel so concerned that I don't know enough information. I want the information. I just, I don't, I don't know, and I'm afraid I'm gonna ask the wrong question. Next slide, please. And it's, it's okay to ask questions. Um, it's okay, you know, when we talk about coming out, um, how unnerving it might be to come out to a provider um, as a trans person. And, and I'm so thankful for the, the two persons who spoke earlier um, and sharing um, your narrative. Um, as a trans person myself, I had a great time talking to a doctor one time. I had a kidney stone and the doctor said, oh, do you feel it in your testicles? And I don't happen to have them. Um, and I said, oh, I don't have testicles. And he like just completely all the blood. <gasps> Were you in a bad accident? Is everything okay? What happened to you? And I just had a great time because I already had an ultrasound. I had an MRI. They that means he didn't look at my tests, right? Within normal limits also can stand for, we didn't, we never looked. Um, and I don't mean that at a get a provider, um, but also he had seen my scans and I, I have intact uh, ovary and uterus. And that means he didn't look at my scans, um, which it was really funny for me to say like, no, no, I just, I, I don't have testicles. Yeah, <laughs> um, and our, and it, it really is. I would say some of the really basic things for providers, is it okay for we, providers should have to ask questions? And I do apologize on behalf of all providers because we aren't as good as we ought to be or think we are about asking questions. And even just talking about, you know, when, again, when I think about cancers, a lot of cancers have to do with what organ is present and what risk mm -hmm. factors impact that, that organ. And we are, as providers, terrible at taking sexual histories, terrible, mm -hmm. like, you know, and we need to be better. And ask people about behaviors and not necessarily about orientations or, and it's still, um, even though we're trained to do it, it is an uncomfortable topic for a lot of people. It can be sometimes more uncomfortable, the more time you spend with the patient and kind of develop that relation almost kind of feels in some ways, if you're really close that you might be sort of prying, but again, you never know if you don't ask. And, you know, it's going back to another thing we talked about. I remember the week that I was assigned as a medical student with a, my rural community doctor. And my job that week was to get a good sexual history on everyone. And like, by God, I was going to get a good sexual history on everyone. It was going to be like an A plus sexual history. And it was like the worst day of his life. <laughs> every, every patient that came in, he was like, well, there's inflammation, but she's been with her husband for like 50 years. And I'm like, oh, not really. <laughs> so, you know, you start asking people questions and, um, you know, humans are varied. We, mm -hmm. um, you, but yeah, and you don't know if you don't ask. And I'm certainly there. Questions should not be, and unfortunately, also this happens way too much with providers. Questions should not be purient, right? We're good. We're meant to ask real, practical questions about the person that we're trying to take care of. Um, and hard to know how. I think there's a difference between providers who are sort of unwilling to address and providers who are just uncomfortable because they just haven't practiced enough, haven't gotten used to the language enough. And, and if they would sort of just dive in and try, they would, um, everyone and particular patients would be much more comfortable. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, and Liz, I love, I love that. It is, it is definitely fun to mess with them sometimes. You can go to the next slide, um, please. It is really fun to mess with, with with folks sometimes, and and you know I think it is that thing of the absurdity, right? Again, the therapist, right? It's the absurdity of um, is it that? And I think we start getting into the philosophical 
um, discussion of gender and how does gender play a role in our relationship with others and you know the perception and we could be here I think for eons having really joyful conversations navigating that. Um, it's really wonderful. I love that so many people are acknowledging that language evolves, right? So they're historically the word transgendered. Well, I mean, even further back, if we go into words that puts the word trans and sexual together, um, that that was the, the word that we used, right? Transgendered was the word that we used as providers. And now it's transgender. Um, language evolves. This word transgender may not continue in the next two, five, 10 years. Um, we currently use gender confirming or gender affirming um, for surgeries. And FYI, not all trans people want GCS. Um, we tend to say GCS instead of GAS, even though that would be funny. And I do wanna put it out there that as a provider, you are going to misgender somebody, whether they are cisgender or transgender or non-binary, agender, that's gonna happen. Um, really wanna encourage folks to just say, oh, I misgendered you, I'll do better um, and move on, right? Because a number of us know the um, experience of somebody says, I'm sorry, and we automatically have that response of, that's okay, right? And we excuse that person's error. Um, I think it's it's space for us to really consider, is this going to be a problem for a provider, right? Is this a problem for me? Do I have this problem? What can I do to work on this? It's not the person, the client who came in seeking help. This is my, as a provider problem. And yeah, somebody said, I appreciate this slide. Language ever evolves. We don't use the same medical equipment that we used to use. In some cases we do, right? The good old, what is the, the back? Um, it's that rhythma, uh, rhythmical back and rub to help loosen up mucus in the lungs. I know we used to do that in one of the rehabs I worked at. Um, but we don't use the, that language because things tend to change. You can go to the next slide, please. And, you know, I want to <clears throat> call attention and acknowledge that the third bullet point where it says, you know, can the front desk refrain from using honorifics? I left out an important honorific, and that's capital M, lowercase x. And that is, you know, a commonly used non-binary um, way to address a person. And I'm typing it in the thing so you all can see. It's just pronounced mix, mix layock. Um, and I really, I want to apologize for the bias on my part for omitting that from the slide. Um, one of the ways that as a provider, um, I try to open the door for people to feel more comfortable is to say, hi, my name's Ari. My pronouns are he and they. Um, how do you want me to address you? And that might even mean for somebody who says, well, I want you to address me as and they tell me by their last name. And absolutely, that is not a problem, um, Mix Smith. Um, I'll certainly do that. Um, also, I don't know why I use the name Smith. Anyways, uh, coming back. Uh, but I think it's really important for us to acknowledge, right, some of these spaces um, and recognize that we, we work with some people who, who really prefer to use their middle name as their first name, and we don't have a problem doing that. So recognizing that we can address a trans person by their name rather than their government name. Um, and recognizing that maybe it's not preferred pronouns, it's just pronouns. Um, Cause it's, it's not my preference, it's who I am. Uh, next slide, please. I wanted to address actually a little bit too, Ari, in this spot about, um, you know, when you are, when we do things like group events, like our vaccine events or, and we have paperwork that has um, your, your pronoun option. And we sometimes, you know, we take, it's a, it's a free clinic and it's in my oath to take care of everybody who comes to me to be taken care of for um, medical care. And so we sometimes run into situations where people get the paperwork and they roll their eyes or they, oh, why is this here? And, and, you know, I think uh, Christina, our health outreach um, coordinator, cause I used to get frustrated just gave me a great way to just help re-educate our folks to help sort of push down their response and, and get them to need more understanding. And I just remind them, I'm like, well, you're here for care, right? And we um, we really believe strongly that everybody should have medical care. Do you agree? And my, yeah, I agree. And I'm like, well, would you want to come to get medical care in a place that you're not comfortable? No. And I'm like, well, that's what we do. We want to make sure that everybody who's coming here feels comfortable that they're going to have safe medical care. And you know what? Sometimes people really rethink and it changes their behavior, but it de-escalates the confrontational issues. And it really, um, 
it's been a great way for me to be able to have a better conversation and for us to also create a safer place for our clients because the people who they are here with are now sort of re-reflecting on who they're being, their whole community coming into clinic. Mm -hmm. Thank you for that. You can go to the next slide, please. I think when we have these questions about how to do these things, um, you know, flags or flagging, which, you know, it's that the, the symbols or the quiet ways that we let people know who we are or how we interact. Um, I think if you look in the back of Dr. Waller's background, you can see really affirming messaging behind her. Um, and I'm in a, a, not in my office, so please ignore the scenery behind me. Um, but the, the flags, the symbols that we have behind us really help identify um, to clients um, that who we are and how we provide services. What types of pamphlets do you have uh, in your waiting area? Um, what do you have showing? How do you address? Um, how do you create a space? Something as simple as really that minute rainbow sticker. I remember in, you know, in the early 90s before the interwebs, and the way that we found the gay bookstore was by looking for the tiny, tiny rainbow flag. Um, somebody said they were up in Massachusetts. I used to be up in the Northampton area. And, you know, you can find a gay bookstore everywhere there. But, you know, before I got into those spaces, it was having to find, you know, where's the rainbow? And, and that's how you found the space. Um, Look, look at flags, update, look around, post a, uh, that non-discrimination policy that really specifically identifies sexuality, sexual orientation, gender identity. Um, and, you know, when, when a client comes out to you or a patient comes out to you, if you are doing coordinated care, I'm going to say, thank you. Thank you for telling me and trusting me. Are you out with Dr. Waller if we do case consult consultation? because I need that person's consent, right? So if I'm going to identify a person correctly with my colleague, I need to make sure that that colleague is aware so that I'm not outing somebody if they don't feel safe. Um, so behind closed doors, how do we talk about the people with whom we work? Um, oh, I love the handmade safe space badges for doors. I love it, right? And that getting together and having a craft night while talking about the newest treatments. Now that sounds like a really nice team building activity, nerdy, but joyful team building activity. Um, yeah. Are you out to your emergency contact? I love that. I love these suggestions. Um, there was a question that had come in before about um, resources. And there are so many resources in this chat. I'm just so appreciative for everyone who's come to to, to present and share and also posting all these resources in the chat. Um, make sure to not miss out on that. Um, and, you know, continuing to acknowledge our own lack of knowledge is part of humility and it's part of building our cultural competency and skill development. Next slide, please. And, and in building skill development, somebody had posted earlier and I wrote it down in the chat box that some of our knowledge doesn't just necessarily have to rely on research experts um, and really taking that opportunity to learn from persons with lived experiences or those persons who are impacted by the lack of equity. And so these are very few names of people with lived experience who are artists and creators and writers, um, people who are on the social medias um, who share their story and share their narratives. And I, I really encourage people to, you know, when the next time you're, you're doing a, a listen and listening to a book or listening to a podcast, you know, listen to some of these folks. Um, not all have podcasts, some do. Um, I love the Safe Space Rainbow. That's wonderful. Um, and it seems like you, rec you immediately recognize how people responded to that flag behind you. And that's just such a beautiful thing that you're, oh, immediately, right? There's that response. I encourage people to reach, um, look at the National Queer and Trans Therapists of Color Network. There's a radical syllabus on there. Um, and gosh, it's really opened my eyes and given me a number of books to look at. Next slide, please. And here's just, you know, 
a bunch of books. Some are clinical, some are all academic-y, some are narrative-based. I just can't um, encourage enough that you push yourselves to, to, you know, maybe read outside your discipline, um, collaborate and coordinate and have an interdisciplinary or transdisciplinary uh, team and, and really providing that work. And, and Dr. Waller, something, you know, I think that you bring that I'm just really so grateful for is just this willingness to engage. And I'm not saying this so that like, you know, everyone's like, oh my God, that's so sweet. I'm saying this because I think it's also important for, for other folks to hear a medical doctor taking those risks and engaging and asking questions and really sitting with a client acknowledging, hey, this is not going to be comfortable for you. Because you acknowledging that it's not going to be comfortable for me makes it more likely for me to be like, okay, okay, I'm valid. Absolutely. This is not going to be comfortable. That's okay. And I think that's really important um, in all of the work that we do. So really, thank you for doing that. Uh, you're welcome. And you know, I think um, one thing that we also touched on a little bit before too was that I think a lot of providers are willing to engage, but I think it's also important to address that there is still this totally unnecessary, there's a stigmatization that makes um, trying to take care of your LGBTQ plus patients similar to trying to, for example, in primary care, treat substance use disorder, or the, I find the same resistance in my colleagues. Um, and again, it's not resistance, I think it's fear. It's fear of making a mistake. It's fear of not knowing enough. It's fear of requiring some kind of extra you know, specialty knowledge that we're not gonna be able to get. But I run into the same thing. The only other time that I really run into it this much is with taking care of people who are using um, drugs, right? Mm -hmm. that, that, the, that somehow, even though the types of medications and therapies we use for people who are using opioids or using alcohol, um, somehow, even though they are no higher risk, and in fact, usually much lower risk than doing things like anti antiarrhythmics or um, like, you know, medications for blood clots or any of those very high risk medications, that I, the response I often get from my colleagues is, well, look, it's too much. It's outside of my wheelhouse. I'm not going to be able to do it. And the truth is, is and that's the first time that I ever um, actually started treating a patient with a medication for alcohol use disorder. The, um, I, I had a patient sort of handed to me on, on a medication that I was like, well, I've never used this before. And he said, well, you know, the rehab facility that sent me out said you could do it. And I was like, well, you know, maybe I can. <laughs> so I looked into it and it turned out I could, no problem. I just needed to be educated. Um, and it's just a matter of just needing to be educated. And again, I think that fear of, of, uh, of being seen to not know something is, uh, is something that we need to kind of overcome in the community to be able to, there's just like a fear response. I'm not gonna know about enough about this. I'm not gonna be comfortable enough to handle this. I'm, I'm not gonna um, be able to do a good job with this that we need to keep working to overcome. Yeah, evolution, language evolution, knowledge evolution, and again, you know, intentionality. So that's everything we have to talk about. Okay, I think we have some questions that have come in. Um, this has been such an engaging discussion and I think um, there were so many themes that we talked about that are so important about intentionality and validating someone's experience and just being willing to learn and knowing that sometimes it's okay to fail and that sometimes the greatest strength is knowing that you don't know everything. And that's what life's about, right, is learning. And I think um, judging, like looking at the number of participants that are still on with us, we're all in that space today. So really appreciative of everyone joining us. And um, let's get to some questions. So when, I think Dr. Waller touched on this a little earlier, but maybe you wanna share a little bit more. Um, family history can be helpful in cancer screenings and treatment. What do you suggest slash recommend for LGBTQ plus members who are estranged from families? Sure. So no, it can certainly be helpful, but like I said, um, it is the majority of cancers are not uh, hereditary. 
Um, however, if you do have that risk, it's really important to you, right? So, and I will say that folks are not alone. Even if you have very close contact with your family, my grandmother died at 48 of some kind of cancer somewhere around the belly button area to the upper thigh. I have no idea what it was because nobody got that information because no one talked about it. Then it was, I suspect it was gynecologic because of the silence around it, but you know, so, um, but what, but, you know, family risk doesn't exist in isolation. So if there's really a concern, I think, you know, sitting down with a provider and taking a look at what your other risk factors for cancer might be is important. And if, um, and a genetic counselor can sometimes be really, really helpful at gauge, helping you to gauge overall risk and determining what your particular um, uh, management strategy should be. And you don't necessarily have to have um, I know it's genetic counseling, so it seems odd, but you don't necessarily have to have uh, um, a lot of family history for that. You can go through all of your other risk factors as well and get good recommendations. Great. And I think I think this might have been addressed through some of the safe space stickers and just being being willing to educate yourself. But question that came in, how can providers support the needs of the LGBTQ plus community? I would, yeah. you know, again, is it okay? Yeah. I would again encourage, you know, those flags behind you attending community functions, um, voting, paying attention that they are passing laws, um, not just on my trans body, uh, but also on the bodies of those who might bear children or who choose not to bear children. And really being cognizant that the personal is now political. Um, I think it has been historically, um, and white folks have often not necessarily thought about it. Um, so voting, being a political member, being aware of um, queer supports and trans supports, um, SGL, same gender loving supports, being aware of environments um, where providers can go and participate. Um, be that through volunteering or attending or giving some of their money um, and, you know, reading books. Buy, buy books from, from queer and trans people who are authoring books. Um, honor those, those researchers who are doing the research. That's great. And that, that is a great point, Ari, because it actually answered one of our next questions, what, which was, what books would you recommend for someone that's in, interested in learning more? So we will happily share those resources. And I know there have been plenty of resources that have been dropped in the chat. We will do our best to capture all of those and get those back out to everybody um, so that you don't have to fear, furiously go through the, the chat today. Um, all right. Our next question. Um, what are cancer screening guidelines for trans patients? I know we went through a little bit of the three different recommended um, organizations who provide guidelines related to, you know, breast and chest screening, but um, I think that might be a little bit hard to get into all the different areas, but is there a good resource that, that you would mention, Dr. Waller, about those resources? So basically, I would say it's organ focused. Right. If you have an organ that we have a great screening test for, then you are eligible for screening on that on that organ. But, um, it's interesting. I think the most complicated one, um, again, is probably um, probably breast cancer, just because there is there's just really limited data. We just don't have great data, and certainly um, uh, men who are undergoing, you know, people who are born as men who are undergoing. Um, uh, hormonal therapy, the, the, there is an increased risk for breast cancer. We do, it's not, it's not really high. We don't have a great magnitude. We don't have a lot of studies. And again, it's consensus that we start five years out. There's not, there's not rigorous data that shows this is where we're starting. The, um, but otherwise, if you have a prostate, you should be screened for prostate. Should, well, you should have a let's risk benefit discussion on being screened for prostate cancer. Again, I think the shared decision making is really important because I know I reviewed um, breast cancer screening guidelines, but it is no less complicated for any of the available tests that we have. I think for the PAP guidelines now, the, for, for cervical cancer screening, we have at least three statements that are non concordant. <laughs> Here and it's um, but I would say base it on organs and base it on behaviors, right? That's a great point. 
Okay, we have a couple more questions that have trickled in through our chat function or our Q&A function. Thank you for all for submitting these. Um, okay, this one is a bit lengthy, so bear with me as I try to read through this. Um, in our hospitals, we are trying to improve and update our archaic systems. We are trained to, we were trained to use Mrs. Um, Mrs. and Mr. You mentioned mix. We can train our staff to use it for our patients who identify themselves as LGBTQIA+. But my question is, will it be appropriate to use that when we call patients? Will everyone know the new term or should we speak to each patient first and have the staff use first names instead of the honorees? I mean, HIPAA, three identifiers is a violation of HIPAA. Right. And um, yeah, I'm not a big fan of calling people's names out in the waiting room anyway, if we can avoid it. Although I know it's challenging, but you know, we do ask people what they prefer to be called. I think that's what we, we use, what you prefer to be called in our, um, in our paperwork. And so I think that would be reasonable. I, I agree. It's, it's challenging in bigger systems. I think it's, um, it's going to take a lot of education um, and, you know, a lot of addressing, uh, you know, unfortunately, I wish I wish people always behave themselves well, but they certainly do not. And and so overcoming people's uh, misbehavior, deliberately misgendering people, deciding that they they don't need to um, follow those rules. Or again, I was talking about to Mari about my sister who's twice, and I've I called the the hospital, but twice uh, at a surgical um, site, had the nurse uh, say to her. I don't even know why we have to ask these questions. Like, and it's like, that's exhausting, right? And, and um, but you know, just keep it. But my sister told me, I told the surgeon, <laughs> like, it's just really, it, it's challenging. Mm -hmm. And I will also say that there are whole problems with privacy and calling people in hospitals anyway. I don't, um, it's better than the, the VA where I once had a, a patient who was called to vasectomy clinic, but like, like Mr. Jones, come to vasectomy clinic, Mr. Jones, like, which is ridiculous. Uh, and, and he turned around and left because he was so uncomfortable. <laughs> but there, uh, there's a lot of, um, I have a lot of concern about the space that we use to take in, in to do intakes for patients anyway. I, you know, at, at VCU, we, um, we did our best, but there were areas where there were open spaces where you could potentially be heard talking and it's a challenge with space limitations to be able to do that well. And, and Dr. Pratt Chapman has shared some really wonderful resources um, for cancer care consideration for sexual and gender minority patients um, and some screening recommendations in the chat. Um, and I think a lot of this has to do with the billing companies with, with which we work or the electronic medical records. If you can say, how, how would you like to be addressed when you're called to the waiting room? If that's on your intake paperwork, the client's gonna tell you how to address them and it's gonna pop up on the screen or be right on the, if we're still using paper charts, it's gonna be right on the chart of how to call this person to the room. Um, and that's, you know, that's that person-centered, that's that shift of, of following some of the kind of archaic uh, practices. Got it, and that's so helpful, all right. Um, Dr. Pratt Chapman just dropped into the chat for those who are doing medical billing, code 45 for gender ambiguity. This is Medicare, so um, applies to that population. Can address gender ambiguity for guidelines if billing for CMS, but of course, you know, again, not for private companies. So um, glad that was asked. Uh, we but have the, way that, the way that we change that is through our, our memberships to our associations, to our professional associations, and by lobbying and advocating um, with these places, the, with insurance companies and with our billers and, and the people who are helping us do our billing is by advocating. And, and my endocrinologist had to call my GI doctor recently and I just, I didn't wanna deal with it. I just wanted to get the care and get out of the office. And my endocrinologist just kind of tore into the GI doc because they changed all my lab reports, which changed all my doctors uh, reports. And so they switched everything back around and it was by pushing a button. And so it was one doctor to another doctor who then advocated with the billing company and that changed everything the way it should be. 
That's great. I mean, that's so important. I mean, what Dr. Pratt Chapman said again here about, you know, the importance of having an advocate in place that's willing to, you know, go ahead and speak up and say, you know, hey, if you don't have a policy in place, it looks like you have a formal discrimination policy in place in the meantime. Um, but it does require someone speaking up and being an advocate on your behalf. And obviously, that's why we're all here today, um, the advocacy workshop, to figure out the next steps where we can really impact change. And I think we already have some great ideas. Um, so I think we have time for maybe one more question, if, if uh, Dr. Wall and Ari, you're willing. Yeah. Okay. So um, I think we, we, this is a question we've seen pretty common. What is advice for standard language for breast cancer screening? Can't really say those with breast should undergo, you know, et cetera, et cetera. Yep. Ari and I were just talking about that yesterday. <laughs> Because <laughs> it's challenging, right? You want to, it, that might be, because I really think, again, and it really is your perspective, right? I really think about, um, when I think about breast tissue, I think about like hormonally sensitive tissue in the upper chest area that could result in cancer. <laughs> and so the, um, so. That's an awful. For, right? Uh, it is. So, and it really depends on how comfortable people are um, with any of the vocabulary with, but you know, somebody like, uh, what was, Ari, you had a patient who was uh, called the breast oh, testicles. Yeah, they called them yeah. testicles. The um, and that might, you know, if I think it, I think it's challenging. I think you might need to start, you know, because you're not going to be. You, we couldn't come to. We couldn't honestly. We personally couldn't come to a good answer. We couldn't come to a great answer that didn't involve an individual patient interaction about what you would use as standardized language. Right, I mean, but I think that goes back to your point of you treat each patient individually and that that is so important in, in care. Well, and I wonder what it would be like if the poster said, do you need a cancer screening? When was the last time you talked to your doctor? Yeah. You know, and, and you know, I think Scout had these wonderful posters or flyers for physical plant spaces that had, people who represented multiple intersections or populations. And what if that's what our flyer said or looked like? Do you need a cancer screening? Right. And you know, I and think, you can have fun with it. And I think that also helps, you know, I was thinking about, you know, that my case, I made it easy for myself and it was like, oh, if his daughter will ask me for something, but the, but if they hadn't, and I wanted to ask about screening, I would start with, so, I like talking about cancer screening. Is that okay? And then we take it from there. Start with cancer and then like head into the individual spots. So, but yeah, I think, I think that's a great idea. Great. Well, Even I maybe acknowledging in the flyer that, hey, we all have different things that we call this area, but you can get cancer there. And so. I love it. I love it. Well, that's all of the questions that I've seen that have come in. Um, so I think we're, we're, we're safe to wrap up with, you know, what an engaging and informative discussion today. I think we really crammed in a lot of information in um, these three and a half hours um, today. And as a direct result of today's conversation, the Prevent Cancer will produce a white paper, which we will share with you to guide our future collaborations and partnerships as, as we continue this important work. Um, but our work at the foundation all, also extends far beyond today's event. In conjunction with the workshop, our 2022 community grant cycle invited applicants focused on providing cancer prevention, education, outreach, and screening in the LGBTQ plus community. We are excited to announce that we are awarding these $25,000 grants next month and hope that these will make a difference in lessening health disparities for LGBTQ plus patients. So we invite everyone to visit our website, preventcancer.org, to learn more about our programs, our public health campaigns, and other initiatives. Be sure to sign up for our advocacy newsletter and our publications so that you can become an informed cancer prevention and early detection advocate. Um, so this concludes our event today. Thank you again so much to our sponsors, our speakers, our great speakers today, um, our entire staff, our vendors, and our audience for taking time out of your day to attend our workshop. Thank you. And that's why we shout the best way to stop cancer is to stop cancer before it starts. And here's how.
<laughs> Don't use tobacco and stay out of the sun. If you smoke, you know your vape, but the results ain't fun. And before you hit the pool and throw your clothes in a locker, cover up your skin in some sunblock. Because the best way to stop cancer is to stop cancer before it starts. Before it starts, you know the best way to stop cancer is to stop cancer before it starts. Eat, 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 eat a healthy diet. It's as easy as it sounds. Try to only eat the things that grow from the ground. This will keep you smaller, easier to move around. Whether lifting weights or walking, better fitness is found. Practice safe for sex and don't be too risky. Take a moment to prepare before you get frisky and become familiar with your family history. Get your vaccines to bypass bad misery. Get regular screenings so you can be sure. But sadly for some cancers, there is no cure, but you can do a lot if you just pay attention to the importance of cancer prevention. The best way, the best to way to stop cancer, the best way is to stop cancer before it starts. Before it starts, before it starts, you know the best way. The best way to stop cancer, the best way is to stop cancer before it starts. You know the best. It becomes a problem for you to stress about whether there's a hunch or significant doubt. Make an appointment so you can find out, cause knowledge is power, and that's why we shout.